So we're going to go live and then I'm going to do the countdown because that's just <laughs> the way I roll. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Jimmy, we're going to queue up the, the HR. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Unmute yourself. What would you like us to say, Alex? In a world. <laughs> <laughs> the Marinese knot 20 years later. I think this is okay. winter coming. All those white okay. speckles. Yes, that was winter. It's here now. <laughs> and anybody already here has left. <laughs> Success. Like, oh, it, it looks like they joined the MLM, you know, like fundraiser. <laughs> it's a reverse funnel. System. Westeros MLM. You know, like the Night's Watch as an MLM. They like sign you up for this like kind of terrible game. Hey, bring two friends, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell your buddies. <sighs> Dairy is drinking water. That is unacceptable. Please come back and try again. I'm, uh, we'll drink for her drinking some open I mean, that black bottle is so badass it's pretty sleek it's pretty cool it's just a black bottle alex how what? dare you're you? just jealous yeah but my beer cozy is ezekiel elliott of the dallas cowboys just nothing about that is westeros <laughs> <anymore>. <laughs> uh, i mean okay so should we talk about the final book of a song of ice and fire the last one there will ever be. Is that what you're trying to say? Mm -hmm. That's why I said the final. I'll drink I'm to so that. I'm so proud that I have additions that Jimmy doesn't have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have that either. I've, I actually I've read my mask. Yeah, but Alex, yeah. you're not. An, you don't have a wall of like a song Can of ice and fire Can you hold that up to the camera? Which one is this? It's sick. It's the set from Juniper where they all look like leather and uh, so armor. Sick. Is that one that you can still buy? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, if you have the hardbacks, you can just buy the jackets. Mm -hmm. um, I have the uh, A Dance of Dragons uh, hardback, but I actually read my mass market paperback. And I got to say, and Alex, maybe you can, because I know you're on the mass market paperback train with these. I, these are the best mass market paperback books, like printing wise, that I think I own. Because so many like mass market paperbacks are either too bold, the font's too little, mm -hmm. it doesn't open well. Like those books are actually very readable in ma mass market. Oh, what do you think about, about I think though. was it in the is it only in England or they did it elsewhere where Dance with Dragons they split into two UK yeah they didn't I do mean, that here at all gigantic so it makes sense I actually really like that box set that they sell and they're like different colors the uh small the like UK. leather ones well no in the UK they have um them split so they're actually seven books like mm. it's supposed to be because they're uh, trying to make people think oh there's all seven are out oh <laughs> great <laughs> it's a trick and I have to say I was uh I forgot how long a dance of dragons oh was like God. i i was pushing a little bit like towards the end of this month with this obviously a shorter month and i went on vacation the for longest a book in the shortest month i was like 10 days into february and i was like i'm still reading this book what is happening yeah i uh i had to finish it on the plane there and uh man it was awesome i i, I know uh you know rip roy it was his last uh performance and uh maybe his worst but uh it's always like bittersweet when it comes to an end because it ends so well. Yeah. And I want the next installment more than anything. That, it does. More it like hurts anything all over in the again. world, Jimmy. It yeah. hurts all over again. Cause you get to the end of this book and you're just like, Oh my God, there's so much that has to happen. Yeah. And then, I mean, which that's why honestly, like the thought of next books is just stressful to me. Cause I'm like, you're not going to wrap it up in two. I'm going to pick up the next installment. If, and when that comes out and be like, Oh, so now it's going to be 10 books. Cool. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely not. You, the, like, there's no way you could wrap it in one for sure. It has to at least be two. Yeah. But even and then, then even like we saw, like he was supposed to be wrapping up storm of swords in like another one or two and then yeah. now we're at seven and then it's gonna he's gonna keep pushing the goalpost until yeah. the reason that he doesn't finish it in his lifetime isn't because he doesn't publish uh dream of spring it'll mm -hmm. be because in addition to dream of spring we now have three more that are we are waiting for <laughs> well i do think that uh his page count because we, we obviously talked about the five-year gap and stuff i do think he could get away with publishing more uh pages now uh because but Fine. would we want that? Because, like, I feel like this could have been a little bit edited. Probably. Bit. But he's and already like, said that he has, like... get that way where they don't get edited anymore, that's to no one's benefit. Well, it does have, like, yeah. 3,000 manuscript pages right now for Winds of Winter, is, like, what he claimed. Last well, he's, time he's released 11 chapters as previews, yeah. Yeah. which is crazy. Which is a lot. Um, I actually really, really in, enjoy this book, but I have to say, I think as 
like George is a writer, this had to be the hardest book to write. Uh, and wins is probably even more challenging, but from what we oh, have yeah. published, the things that he had to do. And then I absolutely love how that ties back into feast, like getting yeah. those Jamie chapters late, man, like what a complete shift of gears. But I do uh, feel like because this one both finishes the half of feast you didn't get. And as new stuff, it does feel the most unwieldy. Like, well, that's, I mean, feel, that's like none of them feel very tight, but this is the most like it's an ambi it's ambitious. It's uh, the issue with the feast with feast and dance is that problem, right? Is that he decided to. But so feast doesn't feel unwieldy. It just feels incomplete. Yeah, a little bit. And I would even venture to say that feast is actually I, I guess I think we all enjoyed it a lot when we read mm -hmm. it. Uh, but it, it's a solid book um, as far as like. The climax, it's not Storm of Swords, but I think it could match maybe Clash of Kings for that. And then dance. I think the problem with the climax and dance, or if there is a problem, it's the fact that it is a cliffhanger in a lot of ways. Right. Um, and then yeah. having to do that weight, I think if we have winds of winter, I think everything in dance gets so much better. I just, I, I really believe that. I oh, absolutely. Because you'll get at least some payoff to certain things. Like everything is a cliffhanger. Like yeah. John's final chapter, obvious cliffhanger, like the epilogue with Kevin and Pycelle. But I like, feel like what? one of the most so difficult good. things reading it is, like even though you're told it you know it going in that this is going to be now like contemporaneous with feast for crows that like we're like going back now and it's like meanwhile over here yeah. but like mentally you finished the last book mentally you're like what is next and yep. so there's like even though you know it there was times reading this book when i was like wait hang on a minute like Gilly and Sam already left. Why are oh right? No, this is no, yeah, okay, yeah. But like it's disorienting. Yeah. I mean, I guess it, it kind of makes sense that everything is a cliffhanger, right? Though, because if you consider where a Game of Thrones ended and then Clash of Kings and like a Storm of Swords was just like holy shit moment after holy shit moment. And now you have feast and then dance, and it's kind of like teetering there again, where it's like you're about to have so many you know things happen with like Danny and the Dothraki, what happens with John, what happens with the Wildlings, what happens with Stannis and the Boltons and, you know, Winter and King's Landing, all this stuff that's happening. Well, nothing can happen like, with, anymore with John. That's over. Well, OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, it still hurts when I read that. I'm not going to yeah. lie. Like I read it in uh, the daggers in the dark and mm -hmm. for the Bowen Marsh. All that foreshadowing. Yeah, there's a there is a ton of foreshadowing. Um, even things being described as being pointed as like knives and swords and things like that. And John's yep. POV is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very obvious now looking back on it, but that's still, uh, that still hit me like a ton of bricks, which I was yeah. a little surprised by. Um, cause thought, it just hurts, man. It does. Well, I think it also like he through. does a good job of making it feel so sudden Yeah. or like, it doesn't feel like, I mean, there's a, there's, I guess neither would be a bad way to do it. Cause you could do it where like. You slowly have this creeping sense of dread and then you're waiting for the knife in the dark and you're like waiting for the moment. And that's still that's another kind of suspenseful writing. But here I do think it's really impactful that it's literally this moment of like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I just got stabbed. Like, yeah. And I think that I mean, it's actually I think that's the kind of thing he favors because like Ned getting his head chopped off is like, what? And like Rob getting killed at the Red Wedding is like, what? Yeah. And John getting stabbed is like, what? It's never like the here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. It's always like what yeah and and really uh john's a gambler in, in a lot of ways like he takes a gamble whenever he's with the wildlings and they want to kill the old man and he makes the decision not to kill as a gamble with yep. his life um he obviously then uh makes a gamble uh with mance's baby and doing the yep. baby switch knowing that that could lead to a lot of um devastating consequence it's the hero gene that he has and then he goes one step too far well because he's torn right he's torn between just like holding to his oath and just doing what the night's watch is meant to do. Yeah. But he's also Ned's son and that like, it prevents him from just doing what he's you know, meant to do. He has that honor in him from Ned and he has that, like I have but to I, do what's right. I love the moments yeah. where, um, what's her name? Sleece. Uh, that's Stannis' wife. The daughter. Yeah. Um, oh, the... When she shows up yeah. and that asshole is like mouthing off to John about how he's trying to take the girl and like that he that he's got and, and John's like, I already rejected these things. Like I could have had these things mm -hmm. already, and I said no to them. But sure, go off. <laughs> <laughs> John is great in this book. Uh, I really love the northern politics, um, all, all the way down. 
and, and from all the things that we hear with the Boltons uh, and Elise who comes to the wall uh, to get married, Car Stark. It, it, there, there's just a lot of really cool stuff. And I remember when we were talking about, I want to say it was in Clash. Maybe it might have been a storm of swords, but we talked about how like we forgot how small of the politics kind of get fleshed out when we're in the north and in, in, uh, in that setting. And yeah. then you see it kind of pay off here and you're like, damn, like that was a lot of people think it's meandering like, OK, I don't need to know who's Castellan to who. But George is actually using a lot of that that uh, mm -hmm. groundwork that he laid out. Well, I feel it's like that also, is the difference because yeah. there are books that'll give you all that detail and like it there is no payoff to it. Like it's just mm -hmm. so FYI, this is how the world works in case you wanted to know. And it's hard to tell, you know, until you've seen the payoff, which it's going to be. Is this the situation where you're overloading me with information just because you thought of it? So by gum, it's going in there because yeah. you thought of it and you're not wasting it. Or are you going to pay it off? So like once you learn that an author, you can trust them to pay it off, then mm. you're more forgiving when they throw detail at you because you're like, okay, this isn't just random. I should pay attention. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And and I think this book and, and, and actually, Leanna, I think that you kind of pointed it out is like this book does feel a little wild uh, out there. And yeah. I think I, I kind of like that in, in this book because it feels like each installment, especially Feast and Dance, feels so unique in what they're mm -hmm. doing and even how they're written. Uh, and yeah. then if, if you've read the preview chapters of even the of wins, it's like a damn horror novel from, from what you end up reading. Um, but I, I think dance for me, it's kind of that spontaneous, like who's going to be the next POV that keeps it really exciting. Uh, and also the way that he goes about some of his POVs and the decisions he makes with those POVs like Quentin, uh, which is a huge point of contention among everybody. Uh, I think a lot of people hate the Quentin story. I actually yeah. love it. Uh, but that, that's something that, we didn't really see Should a lot be like of. something in a song of ice and fire. Uh, Who was I, surprised? <laughs> I, I think dance reminds me of a lot of the things that I really enjoy about Malazan, uh, which is that we're getting POVs from people who aren't significant players, but yeah. are a part of a bigger, the, a small piece of a bigger puzzle. Uh, mm -hmm. Like Quentin, a lot of people say Quentin's arc is completely useless. Uh, has no effect, all this stuff. But I mean, come on, like if you had wins in your hand, you would know that that is going to have massive repercussions uh, for the Martells and for Dorn and for Westeros. Um, for sure. So I, 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 do I like think, that. Like just the so I like before I was saying how like the the chronology of it is disorienting when you're mm -hmm. like, wait, OK, no, we're we're back before Feast happened. OK, yep. so that's yeah. disorienting. And then it's also I think the it's just as a fantasy reader, you don't you you go into a new series expected to like. I knew I know I have to learn characters. I have to learn world. I have to learn place. Like I, I've done that. But by the fifth book in a series, you feel like you should feel comfortable at this point to where you're not doing that anymore. And dance is like, you know, 60, 70% of like, I'm sorry, who is this? Like, what is happening? Yeah. So like, it challenges yeah. you to be like, sorry, this is not just going to be everything you already know. This mm -hmm. is basically a whole new cast. Yeah. <laughs> I, with Dorn. I mean, Feast did that too, though, right? Because Feast took you out of like five, four or five but, like, of the main POVs. But Feast was still fewer POVs altogether. So it's still it like, was, but narrower. Like... So you were like, okay, this is narrow. So I can deal with learning a couple new things. Whereas Dance, like everybody and more. And you're yeah. like, oh my goodness. What? It's like, here's the main <laughs> cast again. But also, here's yeah. Dorn and here's Young Griff. It's like here's... you signed up for way too many credits this semester and you're like i cannot <laughs> i i also feel like it's a it's a bit of a bait and switch for some people because i think when especially game of thrones such a tight book very oh, yeah. prototypical fantasy with with good plot points that that kind of go against the norm for when it was published yeah but feast begins this new trend of like alex said kind of switching pvs and then dance like multiplies it and i think some people have a problem with that. I, th I think that they had a recipe and they liked that recipe. And we see authors do this all the time, very formulaic writing. And I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's bad. Uh, Brandon Sanderson does it. I even think Erickson does it a little bit and Malaza. And we could go on and on with all the authors that we know, because, you yeah. know, if it works, you know, if it's not, change broke, it. don't fix it. Yeah. So I think that George, in a lot of ways, took a risk doing this. And I, well, it's I, I would say, like, when you're giving examples of authors who do the opposite of this, you know, that they don't take the risk, I think. And we're saying how this was a risk because it did piss people off. Similarly, I think in Red Rising with the new books Pierce Brown wrote, he took a big yeah. risk because it yeah. was a very different thing. And a lot of people hated. it. I love it because he took a risk and grew it's as a It's a massive writer. gamble, right? Because like, yeah. I don't like for just, you know, quick side tangent, Pierce Brown wasn't going to lose me with Iron Gold, but going from a trilogy of a single POV character and following Darrow and then all of a sudden going to a multi POV story, completely changing the structure of the books 
introducing new characters, different parts of the world. And also making Darrow no longer this like yeah, not the focus. heroic figure that you yeah. can approve of. Yeah. Almost like deconstructing his like prowess. And then I didn't like two of the POV, so it's like Oh, this is this might be kind of rough, but like Pierce Brown basically did the actual good version of how you turn Luke into a bitter old man. Like Star Wars failed at that because they don't understand Luke's character. That doesn't mean that there's no world in which Luke maybe gets a little cynical, but that's not what that would look like. That's not how that would go. And he did like Darrow where he is 10 years on. And when people like he's not like he was in the Red Rising, she's like, no, he wasn't because he wouldn't be after 10 years. So like, yeah. And then people were like, that ruined Darrow. And I'm like, no, you just like it's maybe rough to see where the world would take him. But this is believable. Oh, for sure. But I think like pulling it back to Song of Ice and Fire, I think the... (laughs) Before we go too far into Red Rising, um, I feel like if there was light at the end of the tunnel or we knew that Winds was like right around the corner, people wouldn't be bitching. Yes. You're because right. the, the expansion of the story just adds to the worry of it never being finished. Yeah. Because, I'd, I'd agree. Because like if you just think about it for a second, like what if this was just a trilogy? Like how how simple would this story have been if it was just a trilogy i feel like it would have been entirely different so he obviously wanted to grow it and he keeps having ideas and expanding it you know at at a certain point you hope that stops or slows down but if we had wins in hand and or knowing that it was about to come out i feel like a lot immediately like that all dies yep. and then it'll come back when it's 10 years after that and we don't have the dream of spring but it's like if you knew that wins was right there like it had a release date you'd be like i don't care like let's theory craft, let's get all this stuff. But also going like again. to uh so take a shot because I'm about to mention Abercrombie. Um, but like in retrospect, <laughs> like I think having seen the way that he has continued the story and and kept telling the same world, but he has kept it to a trilogy, some standalones, a new trilogy. So there's like checkpoints. So you're yeah. not just like this ongoing story. And it is an ongoing story. So I say to read it in publication order. So it is just like a saga, like Wheel of Time, where there's like 10 books now. But like, because you can read it as a trilogy, you can read it as a standalone. So like, I think if he had told a Song of Ice and Fire slightly more in that style, because but now we have a whole new cast of characters. So like Age of Madness has old characters and it has, but we changed the focus a bit. So like you, he could have done it where like we had our initial trilogy that ended with Storm of Swords. And then we moved on and had a new trilogy that kept some characters from that and kept some of the world from that. But we're like changing focus now more. And they were paying off some things that were left hanging in the first trilogy. Like that might have been more satisfying. I definitely feel like the first three are an arc and then we continue on. I think it'd be very difficult. And, you know, in a lot of ways, he did just introduce a new cast of characters in some ways. Right. Um, Without the hard line of this is a trilogy And these are standalone, you know, so the semantics aren't there. But I do think in essence, that's what he was doing was opening up a new era in Westeros and Essos Mm -hmm. and Plantos or whatever. Um, I think that dance is specifically like when you look at this book, I think it is George's best writing because his command of perspective and the unreliable narrator is stronger here than any of the other books. And I think a lot of stuff happens in books one, two and three. And I do think a decent amount of stuff happens in Feast and Dance, but I think that George is leaning more on the undercurrents and the themes and the tone of the story uh, and really the transition of a lot of these characters into adulthood, uh, which is obviously a big part of the challenge of these characters being really young. But yeah. Danny's arc, I, and I know there's a lot of people who don't like Danny's arc, but I I think it's fabulous. Uh, and that did take on my my part, you know, I enjoyed it, but it took me uh, some extracurricular reading to kind of see what was going on there uh, because I didn't get it. I, I really didn't because you read these things, and you're trying to keep track of the politics and the names and you're wondering, you know, w- what's happening in these Melisandre visions. There's a lot to pay yeah. attention to, but there well, are. Professor Nuts, can you share with the class what you your wisdom? <laughs> what is going on with that plot line that we don't get when we just read? Dance? Yeah, you looked up something. Well, I don't necessarily think it's not that it get, but I think that there's value there that that could be missed because Danny, this is Danny's transition to a much darker character. Uh, Danny gives up. She starts the book chaining up the dragons. The mother dragon changes, chains her dragons, and she cannot stop thinking about the child's name. I can't remember it, but she does. She mentions it throughout the entire novel. And at the end of the book, when she's in the Dothraki Sea, she says, the only mother I could ever be is the mother of dragons, and I chained them. And she got, tries to recall the girl's name, and she can't remember the little girl's name. And yeah. it is a 
beautiful example of Gurm saying that the signposting he's saying mm -hmm. she has changed. She yeah. tried to go with peace and his dar represents peace. Dario represents war. And this is the internal fear that she has that she may end up becoming the mad queen, uh, you know, hearing things from Barristan and knowing just little pieces of what her father was like. Mm -hmm. Her biggest fear is herself. Yeah. And she does the entire entire dance of dragons is her fighting against herself. And at the end, she embraces fire and blood. Now, obviously, there's a plot point where we have to get through the Dothraki, all this stuff. Yeah. But it is very clear that things are about to take a major shift in her psyche and also in the way that she starts handling these problems. So, I can't I wait in Winds of Winter to see when she like confronts uh, the like r red lightsaber version of herself with the shark teeth. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think with Danny too, though, it's like it's a matter of where she's at, right? Because as much as she wants to be like a not Viserys, I feel like being mm -hmm. surrounded by slavers and a bunch of garbage people, it's like she has to kind of channel that dragon a little bit to even be able to be taken seriously where she is, because like it's a different game than Westeros. Yes. Well, and less specifically to Danny's personal arc, uh, what I've always enjoyed about it on a more sort of like macro scale is the way that George R. R. Martin wasn't afraid to show a, a civilization in which there are slaves and she is mm -hmm. the liberator. And that could be such an easy good guy, bad guy narrative. And he complicates it constantly and is like, yeah. OK, if you just come in and just like change the status quo, yes. you can't like walk away and be like, I did the liberating and everything's great now. Like and there's all like, these conversations about like the lesser evil, too. They're like, well, they're free now. OK, they're free and poor and starving. They used to be slaves yeah. and be like well fed and well taken care of. They're begging to be slaves again. So like the way that he just like it's everything is so gray about that. I've always yeah. loved how it because it's like yeah, overthrowing yeah, a government. Yeah. You have to have a plan to replace it. Otherwise, Which, it's like, chaos. Red Rising Part Two is kind of literally about that as well. Yay, Red <laughs> yeah. Rising call that again <laughs> I, i'm glad you said that because i've heard so many people will just watch the show and say oh germ wrote a white savior story and that's <laughs> if you read dance of dragons you can tell that's the, the dumb person take though the white so savior ignore those people did not work. i mean like he's playing with the white savior trope there's no denying yeah, sure, that sure. and he's subverting it and complicating it and shining light on why that doesn't work <laughs> um is it okay if i read this quote from this blog no. i've been reading Okay, it's fine. Paul is also a white savior, in case anyone was wondering. Oh, God. Jeez, no. Um, so this is uh, I, this is from I think it's called the Marinese blog instead of not, or maybe it's blot. I can't remember. Uh, but I, I can post what? the link in the comments. It, it, this this guy uh, wrote a series of blog posts that I think are literally amazing. Uh, and this is a quote he had about Danny at the end of her POVs. He said. But when we look at the past, uh, unreliable narrator and POV character bias, Martin's aim becomes clear. The whole plot line is designed to maneuver Danny into a mental place where that'll decide uh, where she'll decide to sideline her concerns for innocent life to take what she wants with fire and blood. Martin's triumph in handling this character development is such a natural and organic way. He gives Danny as much agency as he can. Her hand is never truly forced uh, by the harpy or the slavers. He presents her with incredibly difficult situations and places her core values into that conflict. And he makes her choose. Her choices mm -hmm. first go one way, then another. Now the transformation is complete, and the Danny we knew at the end of A Storm of Swords is gone. The one who reaches Westeros will be a very different person. The dragons are now unchained and the gloves are off. Uh, and I think that's a fantastic way of describing what happens in yeah. dance. Um, I mean, also, I mean, <laughs> I know we kind of try not to think too much about their ages, but I mean, like, can you well, imagine 13. being that age? And those are formative years. So yeah. like if that is at that, you have that kind of pressure, that kind of authority, that kind of like prophecy and just like the madness of all of that at that age, like you could not walk away from that and be entirely sane and be a child of incest. That also like hurts, you know, with an that. abusive brother. Yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty. Da I have a lot of empathy. For like Danny here. needs therapy. <laughs> yeah, but I think, and you know, uh, obviously people uh, think about what happens if she becomes the mad queen and does awful things and people forget about what it takes to get there and what she went through and that, even if she does end up uh, doing some horrendous things in the future, like you can still have empathy about how someone got there. Um, and, and she really is a child at, at this point. So, um, well, that's the thing too. I mean, like it's uh, the worst kind of fiction or it, I shouldn't say the worst. Cause sometimes if it's like a fairy tale esque type thing, that's appropriate, but having mustache twirling villains that are evil for evil's sake is just 
this better be a fairy tale because like that's no one ever thinks they're the villain of their own story. Yeah. So like the fact that anytime and that I think that's a, a big problem with some books that try to be like a villain origin story and they like don't know how to do that because like well either the problem might be with the end point because that villain was always depicted as evil for evil's sake so how do you mm-hmm. believably guide somebody to where they're like I'm gonna be evil for evil's sake <laughs> like, that's never the natural conclusion um but so like how someone becomes like if this is a villain origin story if that is where this ends up going like I mean that is how that happens it's a the death of a thousand cuts little decisions mm-hmm, along yeah. the way that push you further and further down a path that you feel is necessary or right for some reason yeah I mean it absolutely makes sense because at the end of the day she has to weigh you know how much she actually wants to retake the throne that she claims is hers or be a good person and like you have to eventually make sacrifices and as you do that over time, it becomes easier and easier to do. Mm-hmm. And but also I mean, the like, what is a good person? Like, exactly. Liberating slaves seems like the easy, like, well, yeah, that's the good thing to do. Mm-hmm. And then it turns out maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. What's step two? Yeah. That, that's always a good question. Uh, when you when you propose toppling some sort of step institution. Step leave Dario in charge of Marine. Whereas, I mean, it's easy or send to him be... away. It's easy to say no. It's easy to be the voice of dissent. It's easy to rebel. But mm-hmm. do you have a plan for what comes next? Do you have yeah. a suggestion for an alternative? That's the and if part. not, yeah. then like you have really no business <laughs> rising up against this. If you're, what are you going to replace it with? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Scott said something in the in the chat, and he said, "I'm probably wrong on this point, but uh, but I think Frank and Abraham, mean Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham, branching out with the Expanse and other projects has hurt Germ. I think he leaned on them hard to keep him. I actually agree, Scott, because uh, I didn't know this until recently, but Abraham's the one who suggested the timeline split for Feast and Dan. He, he mm-hmm. talked Germ out of the five year gap. Obviously, Germ already knew it wasn't working, but that they were the ones who tried to help him fi- fix the timeline." Uh, so I guarantee that that's had a huge impact. Um, yeah, I mean, at this point, you almost just have to roll with it and just let everybody be young. Yeah, and that's what he said. If 12-year-olds have to save the world, they have to save the world. And yeah. it's like, yeah, I mean, it's fantasy at the end of the day. Like, it is what it is. And also, there were people who were regal in and in courts at 14 and 15 oh, yeah, in, sure. in the medieval times. So, and that, and that definitely plays into their character and their rash dis, you know, decision making and how easily influenced they are. Um, I mean, because if you're a child king, you're and you have all these, you know, people that have been doing politics for 40 years. But it also enables the, you know, the people to be regents like Cersei wants to be because, like, mm-hmm. the nominally, Tommen is king, but. Tommen is not king of anything. No. Tommen is king of the kitty cats. He's he's a boy and he's adorable. (laughs) Tommen is is bloody adorable. I just remember him riding his little pony and doing his little joust or whatever. And then Joffrey being against the straw. Yeah. Being a complete asshole and making fun of him. And I'm like, and the actor they picked for Tommen was also like really good casting, both for like the little, little Tommen and then older Tommen. I was like, yeah, that's exactly how I picture Tommen. Yeah. Tommen, Tommen's an R8 Lannister. There's only a few of them, but he's one of them. Well, Jamie is, is, is all right. Ish. Well, he's a Chad. He's a Westerosi. All right. (laughs) I mean, yeah, Yeah, I guess. And a world full of garbage people. Jamie's cool. (laughs) What did you guys think of this prologue? By the way, we always talk about the prologue. I was about to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was chilling. See what I yeah. did there? It was cold. So. Yeah. Well, I feel like again, like we've talked before about how like he uses <laughs> prologues to be like the establishing mechanism for the otherworldly elements. Yeah. yeah. So, so once again, we get war game. That's what this prologue. We did. get warging, and we also see someone come back from the dead. Uh, you know, we, we hear about someone going in and out of animals to save their life, which we obviously can assume that John would be uh, the example here. We also see the White Walkers coming back. And it's interesting that we see a relationship between Vesemir and Thistle. And, you know, Vesemir sees Thistle come back. And it always makes me wonder, like, are we going to see a character come back as a White Walker? Um, whether that be Benjamin Stark or, or somebody else. Probably a dragon, I think. Yeah, I mean, After I mean, a giant chain out of the fucking ground. There is ice dragon. So, so are, are we are we like fully in on cold hands is Benjen though? No, Germ has actually specifically stated that he is not. Did he? Yes, uh, he there's a p- page of a manuscript and the editor wrote Benjen cold hands question mark and he put no with underlines hmm. like signifying a lot of people think it's dunk. From Dunkin' Egg, oh. which is fascinating. And there's a lot of Dunkin' Egg uh, little like tidbits here. Uh, one of Brand's visions 
shows someone in the Weirwood kissing and it's a really tall guy and a lady it's old man and dunk is what it yeah. is. Yeah. And I'm just like, you know, as a dunk fan, I'm just like, yes, I love it. You know, old man's also. Well, then, I mean, yeah, that, that could be interesting then because you still haven't seen Benjamin since ever. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I feel like you should at least bring him back in some capacity. So, yeah, as a walker. Or at I least mean, have closure on what happened to him. Yeah. But, like, if you bring him back yeah. as a walker, you'd have to, like, have him be recognized. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think that it would have to have some sort of significance. It just makes me wonder because Gurm does signify a lot in the prologues and he's going to re- he shows it to you in one way and then does it again later. Yeah. Uh, and I just wondered, I don't know, it's something I wrote down just, you know. Well, also, I mean, if a bunch of the Starks show capacity for warging. So who's to say mm-hmm. Benjen's not a warg? That's actually a really good point. Yeah, that's a good solid man. point. And so, what like, if-, if he did die, he might be alive in an animal Shit. that comes. What if he's Mormont's uh, raven? Shit! It says crow <laughs> a bunch of times. <laughs> king, corn, 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 king, king, die, die. Yeah, uh, the Raven. MVP. He's sitting there as a crow, just like, damn it, why can't they understand me? It was also a very good callback uh, to John thinking about cooking the bird because Mormont also made comments like that, and you could yeah. tell John was like, oh, why are you being so mean to the bird? And now he's like, I, I hate this bird because <laughs> every time someone walks in, he tries to get fed again. He's like, he's already ate. You know, it's just like my cats. You know, you go in the kitchen, they think it's feeding time. I thought were you saying Vesemir or Veramir? Yeah, I'm sorry. I said Vesemir. It's actually Veramir. I apologize. <laughs> I just looked it up because you said Vesemir and I was like, the Witcher? Mm. I was like, what? <laughs> I got it mixed up. It's actually the same universe. <gasps> yeah. So, yeah. Oh, we also get to see a little bit of Weirwood Network in the prologue. Yeah. Uh, he kind of talks about the trees and how they see and uh, it, it. We obviously know it now, right? Because we've read and everything. But if you think about that before the brand chapters, where we get a lot of lore. That's a pretty big moment in the prologue. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully they actually do something with it. They yeah. being him? <laughs> they being... There's no they in this. There's no D&D in this. <laughs> Listen, it's somebody a, it's a... can help George out, okay? Uh, George did have a blog update for anyone who cares. Uh, and at the top yeah, of this where thing, he, he's still working on it, guys. I was like, was it a football update? <laughs> no, no. He first thing he put was he's working on wins, and he also built a railroad recently. So it was amongst his thirty-five other things he has going on. He's still working on wins, it, but it he's also be- very excited about the Marvel comic that he's writing. So, there's hey, uh, wh- oh, by the way, Wild Cards Wild is getting Cards. an adaptation. Uh, just so everybody knows, can't wait. Hey. All right, we. I want to. I'm not going to derail any more than this. I've actually heard Wild Cards the first like few. Don't lie, volumes. Jimmy. We're going to derail okay. for the next three hours. I know, but <laughs> it I, will happen. I've heard Wild Cards is actually really good. I'm not even shitting you. I've heard it's excellent. Uh, so I'm just putting that out there. I might try him. Fair enough. I might try him. If he's spending any time not writing Winds of Winter, he's <laughs> failing us. Yes. He's dead to me. <laughs> what is he doing? He owes me the book. He yeah. owes me the book. Oh, Why don't you tweet at him? Um. Uh, but uh, yeah, just to, uh, I guess to put it back on the prologue, Thistle's death was absolutely brutal, by the way. Because he's like in the wolf, right? Well, well, Thistle is, is the female that, oh, yeah, that Thistle Veramir becomes a white. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And her death is, is extraordinarily brutal. And Veramir, like seeing it, and then Veramir's a pretty big piece of garbage, it would seem. You know, yeah. obviously we see that in the prologue. But I, I think that him being like shook by Thistle being reanimated is like a sign of how devastating. Uh, this is going to be as they uh, decide. I just want to be clear for anyone in the comments that like wasn't on like hour 10 of the last live where me and Jimmy were like, no author owes you your next book. That was sarcasm. We don't think George owes us the next book. Yeah, none of us. We do. don't think that like, Oh yeah. I don't. Yeah. I just yeah, want to be clear. <laughs> you yeah, I don't think that at all. Like that. Yeah. George can do what he damn well pleases. And actually yeah. um, I think it was uh, Urza or Uzza up in the comments uh comments on my videos sometimes Hodor. good good <laughs> Hodor? uh good dude uh, he was saying do we think we'd have the book if george if outlined i don't think it matters because george writes how george writes and it's yeah. clearly worked for him so mm-hmm. it's one of those things like yeah probably i think the answer is yes but like i also don't want that book i want the book that george wants to write uh, i think it's just is- a combination of age possibly well, I mean, not passion, necessarily and just doing money. a bunch of other stuff but also like if outlining is not how he works then we would have no books if he outlined because he would have been still <laughs> trying to make that work and it wasn't working <laughs> well he gets bored he says he says if i outline too much i get bored and i yeah i i get it 
Well, and also, I mean, like, there's, I, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say this is the one right, right way to do it, but I feel like in, at least in terms of the books that I tend to enjoy most, I get the sense that the author is, like, halfway between a plotter and a pantser, that, like, they have some idea where this goes, but are open to, like, having the story go where it needs to, yeah. and if that ends up changing where they thought it was going, well, that's fine. So, like, yeah. it's not entirely off the cuff, and they have no idea where it's going, but it's not just, like, here's the plan, I already have the end point, and if we will somehow get there, I don't care if it doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah. One thing I love about uh, Hob and Gurm did a panel together, and they said, <laughs> the person who's their editor said, why are you so mean to your characters? And Robin Hobb said, I'm not mean to my characters. They make bad decisions. And I thought that was such a clever way of talking about. But she made character. them make bad decisions, right, and exactly. that's me. No, she says she like she stares at it and she goes, "Fitz, why are you?" Uh, she's like, "You're such an idiot." And but that is so like that's the right way to be. Like your character is a living and breathing and has its own moral compass, and it's just like really. I fabulous. feel like there is like a sort of like a a, de a small degree of schizophrenia with like writing anything because you have the sort of have to have to have like this like multiple personality yeah. thing going oh, on yeah. where you can like be in the heads of all these characters and they're they seem to be making independent decisions yeah i think that's why like i struggle so hard to actually like role play anything in like an rpg if, I, if I have like the choice to be something i always default to like the same like generic <laughs> same. guy choices like i can't go that extra mile of like this is my character this is how he would act in this moment so like hats off to anybody that can fucking do that for one character let alone how many characters look at this do you get yeah like, and they're all so morally complex as well yeah. uh, i mean it's really impressive what like the cast that he's built here uh, i think oh, i've yeah. just completely undervalued you know as, as you read other stuff and like leon i'm sure you can kind of relate to this like do you ever well maybe not uh, do you ever feel like you undervalue abercrombie if you've been away from him long enough um she's never been away from him so she <laughs> can answer that question <laughs> i i don't know like i think I mean, I know what you mean, and I have. I feel like I've. It's more been the case with *A Song of Ice and Fire*, as we've talked about it before, which just became like the default opinion that they're good, so you don't think about it. You don't yeah. like. You don't actively think that it's good. You just like it's an established fact. It is known. Yeah. That it is good. Or people and then you it like. Down. Yeah. Yeah, but versus like when you read something and you're actively feeling that it's good versus just mm -hmm. like. I know that the earth goes around the sun. I don't feel it. I don't see it, but it is a thing that is known. A Song of Ice and Fire is good versus like, yeah. I'm reading it right now going, oh, this, but you know what? This is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it kind of, and it gets torn down a lot. Like whenever you're popular, you just, it's a popular thing to shit on. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and that's fine. I mean, that happens and, you know, critiques are, are valid and some are, uh, and you know, you just, sometimes people can talk you off your, your perch right and uh getting back well, i feel this. like once you reach a certain status then people feel the right to tear it down because like it's well it's not that good and it does have flaws and it's not perfect and you're like okay but like just which no one nothing says nothing is like. yeah. yeah which no one says it is right i mean i think we had a pretty long discussion and fees talking about uh george's uh voyeurism <laughs> and, and and it's even more on display and dance and i and i felt it Definitely. He goes a little far sometimes. I was yeah. looking. Um, I did a quick just like googling of things because like I read dance earlier this month, so I like I did a like a refresh to be like, okay, like where am I, <laughs> Westeros? <laughs> um, and but I was like, I specifically looked up like uh the part of Wikipedia that's like critical reception mm -hmm. to dance because I was curious to see what that was because like I don't actually get, like I have no idea because yeah. like I wasn't I don't think I read it like as it came out. Um. And like, I don't know, I, I wasn't paying attention to reviews at that time in my life. So I actually had no idea what the like initial consensus among critics was. And um, there was one of the reviews saying that like every, every, all of the perspectives that have sex have the sex in the exact same way, no matter who yeah. they are or where they are. And you're like, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. You can, you can just tell that's George writing that scene. Yeah. It's not the characters and the like but the way they described it specifically that exactly. it's not because like i was yeah. usually thinking of it in the scene why isn't this working in the scene yeah. but when they were like it's because all of the sexes no matter who is doing the sexing yep. is always the same yeah that, that that was my big issue you know when we talked about like C cersei's just you know she every impulse she has that that could work yeah. that could really work and in, in further her character but then when you do it with sam yeah the exact same way it does take away you know and and that's 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 me criticizing my favorite. I mean, that, that's definitely yeah. like a, a good criticism to make, but it's like if you in the grand scheme of these books, the sex is so minimal. Yeah. And it just in the books in general that it's like, 
if that's what you're taking away from it, then fuck off. But it's one of the things that like <laughs> yes. I I am um, when people complain about reading the sex scenes in Abercrombie books because he purposely makes them kind of grotesque. Um and uncomfortable. But like that funny. is honestly less uncomfortable to me than the sex scenes in A Song of Ice and Fire because these border more on like, no, I think that I you like this. It's like, weirdly like dis- it's weirdly descriptive in a way that you're just like, you're probably like a little bit too into this where yeah. Abercrombie's just like, they're grunting right now. <laughs> it's like okay. And it's like I love that like it's in keeping with the tone. Whereas the sex yeah. scenes in A Song of Ice and Fire somehow don't quite feel in keeping with the tone. Everything else is kind of like grim and dark and realistic, which is like also first law, grim and dark and realistic. So then when Abercrombie sex scenes are also grim and dark and realistic, then I'm like, yeah, like same, like all physical bodies encountering one another, be it a fight or at sex is just yeah. like, oh, I tripped over my own feet and I accidentally impaled myself like sex fighting. Same. Yeah. <laughs> so that it fits. And like, I don't feel uncomfortable about that. Yeah. Versus they, like, they these, I'm like differently. this is uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Derry's right. It is way worse when you listen to it. 100 percent. oh yes roy, roy describing it in his old man voice is fantastic. and i'd much rather listen to stephen pacey read oh, jamie Never. jamie i love you i love well, you what, i think i mentioned it to you guys because it was a sex scene or it was like danny begging dario to have sex with her and i'm just like keep in mind this is roy saying this as like a 13 year old also the voice he does for danny is like the who was it we were it's in like the chat smoker. oh michelle do her <laughs> In the chat, I was like, he does the same voice for Danny as he does for Tyrion sometimes. Some, some other man like, was on his deathbed. You had to give him a little person. bit of a break. He was literally like 93 when he recorded that. Oh, book. I think he does basically the same voice for Aemon Targaryen as for Danny. Oh, the, yes. Yeah. Oh my god, you're right. She's an his, old... his sweet old man voice is also his. Well, they're both Targaryens, guys. Exactly. It's his Targaryen voice. <laughs> That's oh, what they all man. sound like. Okay, so now that we've talked for 40 minutes about, like, nothing. <laughs> Do we want to dive How dare into... you say it was about nothing, Alex? It was about Let's Red Rising about... and First Law and Sun Eater. <laughs> Let's talk about Tyrion. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's talk about Tyrion. Since he kicks off the book right after the prologue as which, he's puking. Which I think George knew if he hadn't started off the book with Tyrion, he would he would have been, you know, chastised for well, that. Well, it had to be either Tyrion or John because those yeah. were the ones that people were like, gimme. Yeah um he, well he's in a weird position uh because he's grasping at any power he can get and we start to see really the darker side of him and oh, yeah. uh and, and also he has a lot of fear when in his thoughts when he's talking to people and him deciding to bed the prostitute instead mm-hmm. of passing on it is a clear indicator uh that he's changed and it's interesting because there's a lot of people who in a place of power that we look at even in society and we think they're good people but maybe they're like good people because everything's going their way you know, uh, I think well, you can tell a lot about a person whenever they're they're down. So I was going to say, so Derry's comment is that I don't get why people think Tyrion is a meaner. He's as mean as he's ever been. I don't think he is meaner. I think he's being put in meaner circumstances. Well, I, so like, I, I think it's bringing out desperation and bringing out like he doesn't he didn't need to be this kind of way before because he had family and money and power and now he doesn't mm-hmm. anymore. So he has to be as cutthroat as anybody and he can't just be like i mean well, i'm a lannister and you know just like he can't do that anymore well That's there's a, a there's a direct uh opposite to this this scene and that is with sansa who mm-hmm. he's married to and expected to have a child with yeah so to say that he's the exact same i i don't necessarily th- i don't agree with that because he is doing something in the almost exact same situation that is different. Uh, you know, both situations, he has paid a prostitute. So it is uh, insinuated that he will sleep with the prostitute. She doesn't want to do it. It's very clear. She's very uncomfortable. Uh, and then he does it. Sansa, it is obviously implied that he will have sex with her. And that is that is just and that's mm-hmm. fair. And that's cause in this world. And he doesn't do it. So it, there is a switch. And I think it's the grasping at power and grasping at having some sort it of It is or it's like either the authors or the characters implicit bias of like Sansa is a precious virginal lady flower who is noble and, and is a victim of circumstance. And we don't do that to lovely ladies versus like, well, this prostitute isn't into it, but whatever, she's a prostitute. Yeah. I think it's written in a way to, to uh, draw attention. I I do. And and maybe it is a critique on society, right? Where, you know, either intentional or unintentional. Yeah. Yeah. 
where well, like the society would care if a royal princess was being treated that way, but like somebody who's a sex worker. They well, it comes like, oh, back yeah, to that yeah. whole like um, pe- the news loves like a white woman who got kidnapped versus like anybody else that got kidnapped and the news doesn't care. But it'll be like forty eight hour, seventy two hour nonstop coverage mm-hmm. of like a white woman who is like middle class to upper class getting kidnapped because yeah. like the like pure flower victimhood is something that like that's what Sansa represents versus yeah. this other woman is like the one the news cycle doesn't care about and Tyrion also doesn't care well about. Jack the Ripper I mean, wouldn't have got away if he had killed Broadway uh, you know he killed exactly. prostitutes because he knew no one gave a shit yeah mm-hmm. I mean um, that's definitely part of it but I also you have to factor in where Tyrion is at this point of the story yes because like at the point that he marries Sansa he's still in relatively good standing like as a land it's a luxury to be benevolent yes like now he's <laughs> He's in a fucking boat, like in the middle of nowhere. Come on a boat. <laughs> he's he's killed his dad. Like his sister wants him dead. He's had half of his by the face cut guy. off. He killed Shay. Like so much has happened between now and then. Also, like the revelation person. about um Taisha. Taisha? Is that her Taisha, name? yeah. That came after. So like he yeah. Sansa treating Sansa well came pre Taisha revelation and treating the whore badly came after Taisha oh, revelation. Yeah. yeah. And and also, I mean, it's interesting because Tyrion actually treats uh, prostitutes and whores very, very well uh, that, you know, he treat. I mean, he, he took one to King's Landing for yeah. uh, for goodness sakes. But I like Derry. Yeah. Said, her if he yeah. And and Derry actually says in Tyrion's head, he's recently been forced to see prostitution as a paid performance, mm-hmm. and he's paid, and he was angry, and I and I I that's why I can see the steps, and this is a very very organic way of going about it. Like this yep. is a very realistic path I could see someone taking. That's why um, he's such a good writer. Yeah, like we're five books in, and like well, all Alex of these... head to forehead, like just realized that no, George the, I didn't read a lot realize. of books that don't do this. but it's like because the all of the character motivations and their arcs make sense mm-hmm. like none of the shit comes out of left field where it's like why did that what no that doesn't make any sense for this character it's like he and that's probably why the books take so long now is like he's methodically planning and like that's how, why like how all this would happen the yeah. stark contrast between season one and season eight is because oh, yeah. you trained your audience to expect patient, slow, organic development from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. And then when you like if you we watch like a, a, a dumb Marvel movie and there's kind of like a rush to like resolve something and someone has like a quick character turnaround. Like, is that great? No. But like, this is the type of movie where like we're expecting that kind of thing. But you trained us to expect patient, organic character yeah. development and plot development. And then and just we're like, the yoink, or now this is a Marvel DC. And then you, you know. kind of forgot. Yeah. Well, even in fiction and in, in, in what we read in fantasy, I, I think that this is not something you see very often anymore. If, if you it's have a, to do. If you have a character stumbling for a book, people mm-hmm. get very upset yeah. uh, and, and will trash the book and say it didn't go anywhere. It does. Nothing happened. My favorite thing in the world. Uh, Sometimes that's true. If like the public. stuff happening isn't actually very like well written. Well, yeah. I mean, you can definitely fumble the bat. I mean, there, yeah. there's no doubt. There's some there's some bad stuff out there. Well, just but today I, I was like talking about how like so I finished Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse and I was mm-hmm. like people told me that like kind of nothing happens and a lot of people say that this is kind of seems like a prologue for what's to come and i was like i mean generally speaking like i don't care like i like a lot of books that people call meandering and like hob is often like arguably nothing's happening it's just like character moments and like song of ice and fire often like arguably nothing's happening and king killer arguably nothing's happening first law arguably nothing's happening american gods meandering and nothing's happening like i'm fine with that but in reading black sun i didn't really like it because I didn't really feel like there was anything like dynamic and interesting going on with the characters, even if like plot wise, we're not moving forward. So I was like, I, okay. Like I don't mind when nothing's happening, but like here truly there was nothing here for me to like, like, <laughs> well, yeah. And it, you also have to take a look at the receipt yeah. and, and, and George makes us look at the receipt the whole time he's pointing to things. Uh, and a lot of people get on George's case about the repetition, uh, you know, um, moon boy and such like we talk about this and there's a lot of repetition in this book as well but what he's doing is saying all that stuff that i did to these characters has consequence uh and a lot of times i feel like that things don't pay off in other books like this Uh, oh for sure i listen to a podcast oh that efficiency is coming (laughs) all the way in the show beginning of season they off streamlining it as you get to the end right because they didn't have the books to go off of they were like how the fuck do we get to the end of this thing like battle big bombastic moments let's go like just 
get it done. And then it's like, wait a second, that doesn't this is anymore. Honestly, this is why I think if wins releases, it will get one, obviously, because it's polarized to this point. Uh, people are, wow, it took 10 years to get this. You know, that'll happen. But I mean, I don't think that like this generation. Mario shut up just in time. <laughs> like, well, Leanna, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. Black. Was 30 seconds later, she would have heard it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <sighs> So the Lannisters' pride is always their downfall, eh? Um, dude, pride brings a lot of people down. It does in this series, pride, honor, whatever you want to call it. Um, I mean, look at Cersei. Yeah. I think she's entitled to so much. I was gonna bring up Cersei, but honestly, like, is that even pride? Because like Cersei is just like she's it's gone beyond Arrogant. pride into like hubris, mental mania, illness, insanity. All right, well, so so you mentioned repetition, though. So we get the uh, the dragon with three heads again in Tyrion's first chapter. Yes, and that is fascinating to me because in, in Game of Thrones, he talks about dragon Tyrion's dreams. a secret Targaryen, right, Diana? <laughs> <laughs> the timeline does match up. Uh, <laughs> just say. So I, I'll just say this and because we're having fun and, and it's book five. Screw it. So I'll be honest with you. The more I read these books, the more I love the idea, but it's not true. So let me preface it with that, that Jamie and Cersei could have been Targaryens because we all know that the Mad King took liberties with Tywin's wife. Um, King's rights, right? So he. he Sorry, are you arguing for all three? No, 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 no. Jamie and Cersei. <laughs> they are would, the would, Jamie, would Jamie and Cersei not fit the Targaryen mold? And I think it's on purpose that they do. Um, but you flip a coin, mad or not, Cersei's literally mad. Like she is the mad I mean, queen. I mean, they honestly, certainly fit though, the mold. Like, they're like, blonde. They're but like white. narratively speaking, I think the Lannisters are they meant to just sort of like represent, yeah. like, uh, not Powers like not corruption. to be like, oh, this is like actually Targaryens. It's more just like another example of how like absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yes. And they mm -hmm. replace the Targaryens in not only like having power, but they began to like resemble them in form. And that yeah. they're blonde and they're rich and they're incestuous and they're a little bit crazy. And how yeah. like this is a cycle that like you can say it's the Targaryens, but really, is it the system? Because the Lannisters seem to be following in Targaryen footsteps. Oh, and absolutely. Cersei still thinks about Rhaegar Targaryen in a very infatuatious. Yep. Well, I mean, also, state. like, I'm sure years and years of wishing Robert was Rhaegar had an effect. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, I guess, you know, obviously that, that theory is not true because if you actually look at the timeline of the World of Ice and Fire book, it doesn't match up at all. But I do think it's an interesting, you know, contrast. And I think that you're a spot on. Lian. I think it is ap that power is the corruption, not so much um, all the other things. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I, I, Megan, I agree. I, I do that. think that Tyrion being tired. That would be and, the ultimate slap in the face. And their aunt, remember, she tells Jamie. Yep. She says Tyrion Tyrion's was the only the real truth. son. Yep. And so it's kind of fun to play with and, and to think about. I don't think it's true, but I do like that a lot. I mean, because he really is the one that acts like that, Tywin. Like, I was like, it's possible yeah. that he's the only true son of Tywin, but not because the other two are land or uh, Targaryens. They could have just been someone else that mom was banging. That could be it. It doesn't. Ha it doesn't have to be like you are your own thing or a Targaryen, and those are the only options. The only the reason why people will lean on that is because they know that the Mad King slept with uh, his wife. Like that, that. I think that that garners the discussion, which George did. But on I purpose. feel like with so many things that are thrown out in these books, that like odds of all of them being a thing are yes. slim. Odds of most of them being red herrings and one or two of them being a thing are higher. And also, it was definitely kind of corny if everything was like a oh my god, he's a Targaryen too. <laughs> like, well, and and uh, again, I don't actually believe those theories. And I think Liana said it in one of our earlier streams. It does make the world feel smaller, uh, yes. which 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 is a pretty big thing. It's one of the reasons why I don't think Ty. Uh, a lot of people think Tyrion's going to run into Tysha, and I actually don't think so. I actually that would just feel so. too like oh convenient. that's convenient. If he sees a it would girl feel that like finding Lando Tysha. Calrissian in this random desert planet because also, what's that he conversation? wanted him back. <laughs> what, what does that conversation look like? I don't think that's an interesting conversation. Yeah, I mean, it you would know, have to go somewhere for it. To, see, it like, would only be interesting if it wasn't just like, oh, he found her and she's a whore and it's sad. Like if there was a re like if she somehow 
learned from that experience and gained power in her own right and became like a criminal underworld boss and like becomes important to the plot. And then like you engage with this character for uh, quite some time and you don't know that that's her. And then there's a reveal that, oh, I'm actually Chasha. Like then it would like have a payoff. It would still be kind of silly and not, yeah, it's really not gonna happen with this style, but like it would have to be something like that for it to not feel corny and gimmicky. Ultra, uh, log- uh, geez, uh, logistically, it doesn't make sense. Uh, we are past that point in the story. Uh, it's not going to happen. You're going to see Tyrion start to take command, come back into his own a little bit. Uh, but the one thing that's interesting about this, or there's a lot of things that are interesting, but this stuck out to me is that his intentions are very clear in this book. And they're consistent with what we heard in the game of Thrones. When he talks about having dragon dreams and burning his family is that he still wants a casterly rock and he wants to kill Cersei and Jamie. And he says that in book one, he says he wants to burn his family uh, and burn the rock. So, I've always been a big fan of he's not a Targaryen, but he is going to use Daenerys and her dragons to get what he's wanted since book one. And he is going to take well, enemy of my enemy. Yes, I, I 100 percent think that we could see Cersei in Casterly Rock after young Griff takes King's Landing. And I think that is very likely that Tyrion will burn Casterly Rock. comments that Taisha is really serial. <laughs> I like the, they're really umbers because I like the umbers. So I was a big fan of that. And Andrew uh, Krause said I didn't take it literally. Uh, I think it just means that Tyrion is the most similar to Tywin. And I agree with you. Uh, it was just kind of a fun exercise. And, you know, Which, I mean, honestly, like, if there are like, if there's fire imagery with the Lannisters, like it, I once again, I feel like it just falls into the well, look how the Lannisters are following in the footsteps of the Targaryens because like fire, while it is a distinctly Targaryen thing in the universe, fire has also always represented the like wild, unpredictable, destructive force. Yep. And so then like, you, it's not like every single time you use fire imagery, it has to be Targaryens because like you yeah. also have an entire like God of light with fire and whatnot, you know, with R'hllor. So like, that's true. It can't be every single time fire is mentioned. Targaryen! Like, no. That, that, that's a good Everything point. Everything is Targaryen. That's a good point because uh, I think the Lord of Light has a lot more symbolism with fire than the Targaryens when we talk about the books. I think the show... Well, just like, I mean, contextually, like I think you can tell when we're doing Targaryen fire imagery or yeah. R'hllor fire imagery or also fire is a thing that people use sometimes. <laughs> and there's wildfire in the dragon pit in King's Landing. Just remember that. You sound what like does it mean? Conspiracy theory. <laughs> and I'm just saying uh, they buried it and uh, it's in there. And... <laughs> All right, turning so the freaking about... frogs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll just down. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, so, so how do we feel about Young Griff? Since oh, we're talking Tyrion, dude, the Illyrio. Like it, hate it. The Illyrio, Illyrio and Tyrion conversations building up to that are but like. So... What do we think of them not putting that in the show at all? Well, that's they would have like confused at the end. That was the beginning of the I already end. talked to Jimmy about this. It was a massive mistake because massive. it it would have, well, had they done more seasons, more episodes, incorporated him, like it ties a lot of stuff together. But also, what does it mean about like, because in theory, they know where the story ends. So like the fact that they were like, well, we can cut that. Well, I, mean, I don't necessarily stupid. know if they said we can cut that because it doesn't matter in the end. I think that they had a, they, I feel like they may have thought that they could finish it out without it. Um, and then they ended up leaning on George Moore for the ending. Like it, it makes no sense to use George's ending and then not use his roadmap to get there. It's very silly. Uh, and I think we all agree with that. Well, I think D and D kind of forgot. <laughs> they did because the they issue is did. by taking that out, you have Danny with no real opposition when she gets there as like, if she wins and she kills Cersei, like she, she owns King's Landing now. Also, there's no, there's no other Targaryen. There's no one claiming the throne. John doesn't want it. And well, she's McQueen. I don't well, want this it. all ties back to the House of the Undying being totally different in the books than it is in the show. The House yep. of the Undying has, you know, the Mummer's Dragon and all these mm-hmm. things. We do not get any of. We get the the Red Door and we get the throne with the th- whatever. Um, but dreams are so much more prevalent here, and they matter so much in those visions. And I think Griff has been. In a lot of people's visions, Tyrion has a dream in Dance of Dragons I thought was cool. It's himself, and he has two heads, and he's murdering Jamie. And one head weeps while the other one is in joy. And I thought that that imagery was just, I mean, it's kind of spot on, but weird. It's, it's so vivid and kind of horrific. Um, and he was also fighting alongside Bittersteel and Barristan, which is really compelling for the fact that he's going to end up with Barristan, we know, and yep. Marine. 
but also Griff is a black fire, which bitter steel was black fire. Right. Right. So this is all lining up. We, we know Griff is a black fire. Like there's no doubt about it in my, in yeah. my book. When we say D and D that's Dan and Dave, the showrunners for game of Thrones who yes. were praised after the first couple of seasons for adapting the book so like, closely and so they're fair, good at they, adapting. They are yes. good at that. They did write yeah, really good original scenes in the first few seasons. I will give they them did. a pass simply some simply because if you were told to finish George's writing, I'd be like, well, no, but also they were told by HBO, <laughs> take all the seasons you want, all oh, yeah. of the we money know. you want. So for they that, there done. is no excuse. They wanted to go film Star Wars and then they're not. So sucks to suck. <laughs> Who do you guys yeah. think Septa Lamora is? Septa Lamora? Septa Lamora is somebody. Does she have to be? Maybe she's Taisha. I was about to say Septa <laughs> <now. laughs> It's very interesting that when she's bathing and Tyrion's being a creep and watching her bathe, which is freaking weird. Uh, she I mean, has Tyrion's a creep in the books. He sure is. Tyrion <laughs> is. You were saying Sam is the George R. R. Martin insert. I think it's Tyrion. <laughs> Tyrion is. I imagine there's a little bit of George in all of them. You know, uh, a little, a little bit of George and Danny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, she has marks as if she's had a child, and some people believe that it is a Shara Dane because her body was never recovered. I thought that was really to what end, though? Well, it would be the fact that um, one of her brother, oh, so her brother died. I'm trying to remember mm -hmm. the exact tie, but her brother died defending the Targaryens, right? Uh, he refused to give up his his oath. Um, but I can't remember exactly the justification other than the fact that Ashara Dane is a massive character in the books that is dead. Um, but her body's never recovered. Yeah. So it's like the telltale sign of something's going on there. And we kind of talked about, whoa, Alex. OK, guy. All right. What, what, yeah. Jeez. <laughs> he figured it out. Um, <laughs> I do think like so. your theory, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> I do think Septa Lamour is likely a hidden personality and it fits on this boat because John Connington is Griff. Then like, young, as Alex said, yeah. so like what plot, what, how does that benefit the plot of what's to come? Is it just like a fun, like, wouldn't well, it be cool if, or like, does it going to result in something actually happening that wouldn't be possible if she wasn't? Well, if it is a Chardonnay, there's a ton of stuff that could happen. When if the sword of the morning, um, also getting more of that information about what happened at the tower of joy. Cause we don't know how that information gets relayed. Bran. Well, of course, but I think that that could be a very key player. Um, and, and Scott says there, he says might just be a fun Easter egg and it could be, but everyone yeah. on that boat has a different personality that is named. So you have to imagine Septa Lamore is somebody. Is George uh, the kind of writer that would do that just to be like a he, he, like if you find this, cool yes. or or would it have a bigger meaning if he did it I without say, like, i think a lot of this not all of them but i think a lot of these types of theories like it might even like in george's mind be true but there's no like necessary like there's no payoff, payoff to it because yeah. it's just more one of those like in universe like it's like how actors when they get a character they write their own backstory for the character so that they know how to play the character and that never yeah. comes into the plot of the play or the movie but like it helps them to know emotionally how they would react to things based on what they've imagined as the past of the character so like if like yes like these people might be those people in george's mind but like not for any plot benefit just because like this is where they would end up and like there's no reason anyone would know it and there's no reason this would matter so but, like that's where they would end up then it's I, likely something that you would never officially reveal right yes. yeah it would it, just be it, like uh well that kind of makes sense that's probably who that is and then yeah it's very much like corn half hand and all the theories that go into yeah. corn half hand it doesn't matter Lamore we'll, sounds like lamora hmm. <laughs> we'll always be able <laughs> to to uh speculate and he has built that in that's why he wrote a history book you know he wants us to speculate uh so he can take more time with the books uh You're like oh you think i did that that actually is a good idea maybe i am doing that <laughs> but honestly liana that's a great question and Fire for and the this is something that I, I don't trust the fandom to do and it bothers me is that let's say george finishes the books let's just for just go with me here he finishes the books there are going to be so many people that say ah Mance Raider is a, it was Rhaegar and he never confirmed it. There's going to be all these little theories that people have speculated on for so long. So you have to have a realistic expectation of what gets answered and what matters. And you can make that distinction. We can make that distinction, but there are 
probably millions of readers who can't like if i don't see brienne get confirmed as dunk's ancestor in the books i'll be furious even though george has confirmed an interview yeah you have to let go of your pet theories uh for instance i was a big fan of mance being rhaegar until i looked more into it and then i kind of went away from it but even if he was it doesn't really matter you know what i mean like or like it it doesn't matter until it does and if it never does then it doesn't yes mm -hmm. yes we, so we like we, and i think that like as a writer who is partly a plotter and partly a pantser by just sowing a lot of opportunities for yourself. It means that whenever you're writing, because you've planted opportunities to people might be more than they seem and it doesn't necessarily matter, but you might water that seed if you want to, because yes. you've decided that that, Oh, actually I can use that right now. Yeah. And then it's just like available to you all the time. And it doesn't necessarily something you're like, I have to find a way to make it into the plot somehow, yes. as opposed to like, it's there if I need it. And that yeah. is that is the gardening style. He leaves options open. Like the reason why Tyrion seems to be a Targaryen and Dragon Dreams is probably because George is playing with the idea, and he probably was like, yeah. "I can go there if I want." And then obviously probably realized that it, it wasn't needed. Same thing with Cersei and Jaime. I imagine by the time that he got uh, the World of Ice and Fire published, where he sets the timeline, he decided that that was not going to be an option anymore. So having these options open uh, is part of the fun, and it's how this text will live on for centuries in my opinion a lot of the stuff in the summer really on is it's open right like, i mean there's a lot of stuff explained but there's also a lot of about questions this, uh lamore is a shard dane and john snow is her son so he will be the inherent dawn sword because he is azora high so i do believe john is azora high uh, i think that that's maybe too obvious to where george could subvert it but i think he is azora high i also um, george isn't the kind of writer where it's like because it's obvious it must not be that like sometimes yeah, yeah it's obvious because subverting yeah, exactly. explanation when, when you look at what's obvious we just said the prologue spells out john's resurrection totally right uh how many other prologues spelled out something to us completely uh a lot of this is on the nose and we just miss it the first time uh which is good writing in my opinion i mean like yeah. george is the one also that in an interview was like if you've been writing it to where the butler did it and then on a forum somewhere someone figures out that the butler did it and you I don't suddenly it. make it that the maid did it like right. no that's not the ending that yeah. you've been writing toward the that's, butler still did it and that's well, he said that specifically about parts of the books didn't he like there yes. were certain theories that people guessed and he was like well r plus l equals j yeah. yeah it was figured out and he said I don't care. <laughs> I'm going because, with like, because... why should you care? Yeah, it's like so it's not like idea. your ultimate goal as a writer is like I must trick them. Like no. it, the idea is that like you've put something and you've put enough hints in where it, I mean you have loyal readers who will pick this apart and it should be figure outable. Like if no. there are seeds planted, yeah. And there's definitely people out there that like study these books to that degree. That's like here's all the excerpts from books one to five. Like, this is why this is what's happening. If yeah. you figured that out, hats off to you. Like, yeah, that's some amazing reading comprehension because even now on multiple rereads, there's stuff that I miss constantly. But it's yeah, also like, sure. if, if it was truly impossible to figure that out, then it's not a satisfying payoff when it does come around because yep. the, what makes it fun, even if you didn't guess it, is that then you reread it and you're like, oh yeah, here were all the clues that definitely pointed to that. And I missed it. Or, I saw all the clues and like, oh, I got it. Yeah, I knew it. I saw it. Either way, it's you need to pay that off. And you, it's good yeah. to plant seeds. And if you don't, if you do everything you can to make sure no one could ever guess this, then like, okay, maybe the first time through someone is like, wow, I didn't see that coming. And then they're like, wait, why didn't I see that coming? Yeah, it's like a day. It really came out of nowhere. Out. Like, yeah. what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think that everything it's kind of like we talked about the character progression. It's very natural. And these things take time. That's why these books are big. Um, I loved, I love, I forgot about this. Tyrion and Jorah's like relationship in the books is so funny. Whenever <laughs> Jorah talks down to Tyrion for betting a whore and he says, Oh, was that your virgin sister sitting on your lap back there in the brothel? And Jorah's is like, man, fuck you. Also the way Tyrion needles him about his feelings for Danny. Oh yeah. So good. And it's the like, reader. yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> the reader talking. At Even just point. from the jump of like, creep. Meeting each other. <laughs> get out of here. Like it's, they did this pretty well in the show too, but just the fact that like they meet each other and he's like, I'm taking you to Daenerys. He's just like, Fucking awesome, dude. Like, that's exactly <laughs> where I want to go. This is great. And then he just messes with him the whole time. Like, it's <sighs> perfect. Yeah. And then uh, Tyrion offers to drown him in gold if he frees him. And Jorah's like, nah, I've seen someone be drowned in gold before. I'm good. And I was like, yeah. what a great callback. Hey. It's like the only personality that Jorah's ever shown <laughs> in the books.
Very, I, I don't know. I love those interactions and I forgot how good they were. It made me laugh. Well, I mean, like Tyrion's always been the like the person that like answers everything with snark. But like it's like off the charts at this point. He's got oh, yeah. like nothing left but snark. Well, we see a lot of his inner thoughts when he's mouthing off and he doesn't say it. But he's not in King's Landing anymore. And he's like, screw it. I'm going to pop yeah. off. He's saying the quiet part loud now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> funny. No filter. What about uh, Makoro? Uh, the red priest that talks about his image uh, that he sees in the flames and it's Euron, and he sees a large dark thing with 10 arms, which is the octopus or whatever, or eight arms or the whatever. Kraken. The Kraken. And uh, he the says octopus. it has one, one black eye on a sea of blood. It's pretty badass. It's pretty metal. Everything's pretty metal. The iron eye it was so horror. metal. <laughs> There's a couple good metal, like very metal uh, scenes in this book, uh, like Drogon landing in the fighting pit so good i'm sorry but nothing about that is as metal as anything in the iron islands iron islands are metal <laughs> shit they literally drown people so they come back to life so like that's your baptism is death <laughs> well if we're gonna talk about the iron islands let's talk about theon because i think theon well, hold on before we go down the reek, reek. before oh. we go down the reek pathway do we want to say any more about Tyrion, or we can come back i guess um, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of it's, uh, we could talk about pay off with Tyrion and dance. I, I do think, and I love yeah, Tyrion. I, his relationship with Penny is very important for his character development, but where it drops off that that's something that I feel like he should have kept in. Cause I know there's more Tyrion chapters cause he, he put them over into wins for the previews. I wish he would have maybe ended it on a little bit of a different note. Yeah. Uh, but Tyrion's relationship with Penny is fascinating, and Penny just might be the saving grace uh, for him. She's so another sweet. dwarf character. She's so nice. But you also learn a little bit about the. Um, but it's company, rare in these books that your heart like genuinely breaks for somebody because everyone is such like a gray mess. Yeah. And Penny's one of those characters that you truly you're just like oh. She's just trying to get by without offending anybody. She knows she's a dwarf and people look down. And, and, and the way that like her brother was killed for no reason. And like that, <sighs> it's not like it's a situation where like, oh, it's war and people die in war. Like they were yeah. just, just dwarves just making the best of it. And yeah, it's they so, thought he was Tyrion, so right? They thought he mm -hmm. was Tyrion. So like you can totally understand why she's like, if it wasn't for you, my brother would be alive. And why couldn't and when that point when she's like, why couldn't you just joust with us? Like they would have laughed. So what? My brother would be alive. Like, what's what's the big deal? And Tyrion's like, yep. <laughs> that Lannister pride. Sorry. Damn. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that is a, a pretty, like, dramatic thing to write, isn't it? Like, that's very dramatic. Like, my brother was killed because he, th he thought it was you, and now we're on a boat together. Like, that's so dramatic. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, Poor Penny. <laughs> Derry said I can't stand Penny. Derry, how <laughs> dare you? <laughs> what, do you prefer nickel? Wow, that was a really bad dad. Alex joke. thinks I'm a monster for not loving the romance in Sun Eater. I think you that Derry just out monstered me, though. Yeah, Penny. Penny. We can all agree on the first romance in Sun Eater being terrible, but Valka is. But a I pretty... like Valka. I just don't like the romance. I Whatever. didn't say I don't Valka. like Valka. Be gone with these opinions. <laughs> Penny is a saint. There's innocence and there's not the appropriate to the life, and we're told Penny has led. I don't know. We give a pass to, to Cersei and a lot of people. I think we can give a pass to poor little Penny. Who the fuck gives Cersei a pass on anything? A lot of people give Cersei a pass. They're a bunch of psychos. <laughs> I, I feel like there's a difference between like understanding how a character got to be the way they are and giving them a pass. You can, yes. So I, I've had this conversation many times with in real life situations where you can not excuse behavior, but you can understand what probably sparked some of that behavior yeah it doesn't make it right it doesn't make it forgivable, well, that's what i always like, say about like romance why. like romance stories where there's like an abusive angry brooding like it's usually the dude that's just how it is and then like and they're like they seem cruel and then you yeah. find out some tragic backstory that like in theory explains why they're so cruel and i'm like okay yes that does explain why they're cruel that does not mean that this is now a healthy romance that does not mean that this is okay that he's treating her abusively now it means that oh i get it now you're not a like a, a senseless bully you you need therapy and i am not your therapist so like that doesn't mean that you should be taking this out on the innocent victim your love interest that is still not fine but yeah. i get it you need help yeah yeah, you can be understanding and empathetic with someone without having to uh, subject yourself to the abuse. And like understanding is different from condoning. 
Yep. Oh, for sure. Yeah. All right. So before we step away from Danny and Tyrion, I just, I honestly forgot, just random side note, that Zaro was even like alive in this book. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I had it in my brain that like season two Game of Thrones or whatever, like he was locked in the vault and he's never seen again. I was like, wait, Zara Zoran Daxos is like still a character in this book and he's still like actively talking to Danny. And I was just like, that's interesting. I just, that's just something I like completely. <laughs> Didn't you about. die? <laughs> I was like, aren't you in a vault dying of starvation? But no. Um, I said, Reek. Well, actually, one more thing about Danny. I, I wrote this quote down from Quaith, who we see again in Dance with Dragons. Yep. Uh, she, uh, Quaith says, the glass candles are burning. Soon comes the pale mare, and after her, the others. Kraken and Dark The Flame. pale mare? You mean the horse that Arya rides on at the conclusion? How dare you? How dare you? It's the plague. It's coming. It's grayscale. No, it's a literal white horse in the middle of King's Landing. <laughs> Don't do this to me. <laughs> uh it says uh kraken and dark flame lion and griffin the sun's son and the mummer's dragon trust none of them remember the undying beware the perfumed seneschal is that how you say that uh denair says resnak why should i fear him if you have some warning for me speak plainly what do you want of me quaith quaith says to show you the way uh which is i mean there's a lot to unpack there and then we don't see her again right we don't see her again in this book, no. And we still don't know who Quaith is or what, what the purpose behind this. We know there's glass candles burning in the Citadel in Old Town, which is fascinating. Yeah. Quaith um, is a Targaryen. <laughs> confirmed. No, Quaith uh, is Taisha. Oh. <laughs> Taisha Targaryen? How do I leave this stream? Do I just hit leave? <laughs> leave? <laughs> you're either Targaryen or if you're a female, you're Taisha. Those are the options. I mean... I know it doesn't get paid off here, but think about this convergence that's called out by Quaith here before we know this stuff. The crack. So Euron and Victor, uh, Victorion's coming, right? Uh, from Euron. We have Dark Flame, Lion, and Griffin. So we have um, we have Tyrion coming. Yep. Uh, we have the Sun's Son, which is Quentin, and the Mummer's Dragon, and then Griff is obviously turning around and going to Westeros. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's really, really cool. <laughs> Quaith this Tyson might be the best theory ever. Oh my god. I don't know. I like <laughs> Quaith is Rhaegar. Everyone's trolling me. Everyone's <laughs> trolling <Ray> me. <laughs> Quaith Everyone's is a Skywalker. <laughs> I mean, um, honestly, so I know we're not talking about the TV show, but like when we were talking about why the TV show didn't work and how like it started rushing, like it was the same like mentality as Rise of Skywalker of like if we rush through everything fast enough, you won't notice the plot doesn't make sense anymore. So we're just going to like speed on through this and you're going to just be so dazzled by the spectacle that you'll be like, I guess that was good. What happened? I mean, the show, just before we get back to the book, the show made the mistake of taking too many fan theories and just making them fact. Or yeah. taking fan theories and being like, we can't do that because they guessed it. Do the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Whereas George obviously has an intent for his work and he knows what it is. Yeah. Um, which I think a lot of people in their heads get confused about what this is. And I think when you reread the books, it puts it back in perspective as a fan. Uh, for instance, you know, um, there are some theories that I hold kind of near and dear. And as I go through, I accept them because I'm a reasonable human being that I go, oh, I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, and I think there are some people who can't let that go. And if or when wins and Dream of Spring come out, I think there will be a lot of disappointed people. But I think that there'll be great books regardless. Um, we kind of talked about the pale mare. So can we talk about John Connington since he's right next to Danny? And I don't have a lot on him. Um, but did you guys notice in John Connington's uh, POVs, there's a lot of references to bells? <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. I'm serious. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, I wonder that bells ringing. So stand with me here. I think that Danny does burn King's Landing, and I think it's because young Griff is ruling at the time. And that would you, make a whole heck of a lot more sense than what they did in the show. It was. Yeah, so I, th I think we can all accept the the path of Danny becoming the Mad Queen and burning everything. Yeah, I think so. It just didn't make sense in the show because it was rushed. Well, yeah, I, think I think that's understandable. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of bells, uh, bells in Danny's POV as well. You can look it up. There's I think it's referenced like four or five times in this book and then other books as well. So it's going to be interesting to see John Connington's POV in King's Landing possibly as it's being burned with Danny's POV and the bells ringing in both and what that means for them because you know the Battle of the Bells is what John Connington thinks of. Um, and along with that, he was in love with Rhaegar. And... I mean, I think that's fairly obvious uh, when when you read the book. But he has grayscale. Who now. wasn't in love with Rhaegar? I'm in love with Rhaegar. What a Chad! 
um but he has grayscale now and i think that that is the pale mare and i think that that is one of the things that is going to happen in westeros i think that there will be a grayscale pandemic uh that that will kind of go through i wonder because of maybe him. that's why winds hasn't been published yet because george r, r. martin was like during covid scale. that's a little bit ghoulish there's a lot of authors that right backed now. off their their works apparently robin hobb was writing a realm of the utterlings book that uh a novella that centered around a pandemic type thing and she backed off of it uh as stephen Fuck king off. as well Too soon <laughs> so. stephen king wrote the stand okay. <laughs> yeah but he was gonna write something like recently i guess like a covid Who book cares? Or, just do uh, it I mean, it might not even be the author who thinks it. it's probably the publisher that says, yeah, like, it's whoa, probably. Yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. That's just also silly to me. It's like, yeah, everything just means it's COVID, you fucking morons. No. <laughs> the trigger is totally John Con and not Danny. Interesting. They're ringing the bells. They're surrendering. Given that John Con thinks he should have burned the Stony Sept and he'll be at Fagon's hand when Danny arrives. Yep. It's going to be really interesting. John Connington was a very surprising POV to get, I think, in these books, and I'm glad that he was included. Uh, and it's also one of my favorite things about dance, and I know that people think that there's bloat when it comes to the POV count, but I really like like one-off POVs or like smaller POVs, and I think that they can do a lot to further the story, and it's something that's used in contemporary fiction a lot of times, but not fantasy. Uh, it's something that Malazan well, this does. Is where, but that's also where, again, I would say, like, just Malazan's like the whole, fantasy, like, you can give on. us information, like, a, an excess of information, and then some authors don't pay that off, and some do. So, like, yeah. some authors do, like, it feels more like cheating. If they put in a POV that wasn't normally a POV, and it's yeah, only a yeah. POV once, you're like, you just couldn't think of a better way to get us this information. So you were like, what if I just, like, randomly made that a POV? There you go. Versus, like, an intentional careful usage of that if and when necessary and john connington such a prominent figure in the history and we've heard his name multiple times in other books so to finally get that pov feels like a payoff Entirely and then i think it'll have a bigger payoff in wins a winner as well so mm -hmm. i think but also right. john connington sounds like it would be like the character from some like long-running special ops like john, john connington john wick in. or uh john connington <laughs> what is it uh what's that jack ryan is that what his name it is? sounds like an yeah. amazon prime show like John Connington has John like, Connington. Yeah, they love back male together names. once again. I think Jack is it. Richard. I feel like a lot of them are. I feel like I'm combining John Wick and Sarah Connors and like making my own like. John. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess should we just kind of cover Marine? Should we talk about Quentin now? Might as well. Okay. Cool. Oh, what's Crystal say here? Do I feel like Danny will kill Fagon and then John Con will lose his ish? So far, Ned Line, King dies and the hand gets buried. Rings true. Example. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, Crystal, I think that that is probably dead on. For sure. Um, wh what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. Quentin. I feel Quentin. like the next king in hand to go off then is Stannis and Davos. Yeah, that's Stannis oh. is never going to be king, though. Don't hurt my boy Davos. But that's next up. <laughs> You're right, and that hurts. Um, I don't think he'll die to the Boltons, though. I think he'll survive that. Possibly. It, it, actually, we, we and we can speculate. Davos is a very interesting character because uh, I don't know where he ends up because I don't think Stannis makes it out of Winds of Winter. But does Davos? Why not? Because the hands have to get buried. Didn't you just read that comment, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> Davos must be protected at all costs. You're damn. I mean, I love Davos. I'm not saying I want him dead. I'm saying this is Davos next in the pattern. But, but no, like, so where do you guys see Davos going if, if, if or when Stannis falls? Because I don't think he'll, Gurm's not going to take that big of a POV who has had a significant page count and just be like, oh, he's a guy that's in the background. Like, I don't see that happening. So does I mean, he play a I mean, role even if he dies, start? it's not going to be just like, ah, uh, he died. <laughs> like, <laughs> if Stannis dies, I think Davos goes to John. <laughs> wrap my boy in bubble wrap and pot armor. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was very humorous. <laughs> I think Davos will go back to the wall and we'll get some version of what happened in the show. Well, well let's Wait, talk why about... would he go to the wall? Well, let's talk about what he's doing right now because oh, yeah, he's he's totally not near the wall at all right now but fair. well he meets a, a mute boy named uh wax who was formerly theon's squire 
who I actually feel like may have an important role to play later. Uh, but Manderly says Wex saw Asha and Rick and leave Winterfell as he hid in the heart tree. And mm-hmm. he wants Davos to smuggle uh, Asha and Rick and back from Skagos, which we are full of cannibals and supposedly unicorns. Hell yeah. so sick. Sounds like a fun place. Sick. <laughs> Dude, cannibals you, riding unicorns. Don't be surprised if Davos is one of the very first POVs and wins a winner. And the first thing he sees is some is freaking unicorn? unicorns. Dude, I would be so in. Like, I'd be like this magical, wonderful creature. I mean, can you just remember, like, I mean, just imagine like a rainbow unicorn with like cannibals a walking dead esque, like, cannibal monster riding it. Yeah, dude. I, I think Skagos is going to be interesting. Rickon is definitely going to be... Uh, I mean, what in the hell have they been doing on Skagos? Or Germ will subvert it, and there's nothing wrong with Skagos, and it's a perfectly wonderful island. You know, who knows? But they'll have to come up with a reason why those rumors started, so we'll see the origin of those rumors, like something that they do or have. Or and ships do get wrecked out there all the time. Mm-hmm. So that's another good question. Maybe that's where Howland Reed's hanging out or something. I don't know be interesting that also do ships get there. wrecked out there because like shipwrecking on purpose is a thing throughout history that people have done you yeah. know wreckers where they like purposely use like fake uh lights you know to like guide yep. ships incorrectly so like is that what's happening are these cannibals really just purposely sinking ships <laughs> and therefore killing people <clears throat> all right guys he was a hundred percent dead because that's how they wrote it all right <laughs> Yeah, I think Rickon actually has a bigger part to play in, in the books. And in, I I don't know. I love that Davos is going He's there. He's also super young, though. I'm so excited. Also, what about when Davos shits on the phrase to their face? It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. Fuck the phrase. <laughs> Fuck the phrase. Bunch of... Never mind. I was going to call them pussies, but that's not... <laughs> Sorry, Alex. I apologize. Apologize for what? I'm not monetizing You this. should apologize <laughs> to me. <laughs> oh, Lana, I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, the North no, remembers. No. Uh, Wyman Manderley is awesome too. Wyman Manderley, yeah. big jolly dude. I love him. Um, I think that that whole plot line of Davos being executed was awesome because we, we heard about in Feast. Do we think for sure that Shireen gets sacrificed? She does. Ger- Germ actually yeah. confirmed that. Yeah. That's yeah. So sad. Rip. It's one of the, uh, he called it an oh shit moment. There were because a couple. going to be like, okay, there's no turning back for Stannis. Yes. There's Hodor. Yeah, it's, it's all in. What is it? Hodor, Shireen. So he confirmed that John. Hodor is Hodor because of Brand warging into him. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Which did seem like a very George R. Like, there's no way D&D came up with that. Like, no. that seemed a very George Did R. he R. confirm R. Like. where that happened, though? Uh, do, When you say where, do you mean like in so the So is it because we get, and we'll get to it, but like Brand meeting the Three-Eyed Crow, like being in the cave with the, the children, and then... Like the literal hold the door moment when like they get attacked and they have to leave. Like that's what happened in the show. Like is that what he confirmed or just the fact that Bran destroyed his brain by worrying into? No, him? he's confirmed the moment in the books of hold the door is okay. exactly okay. it. And Bran has been manipulating time this whole for yeah. all this timeline, mm-hmm. which is a really cool thing to do. But do you remember back? I think it's a Game of Thrones when Old Nan says. Brandon Stark, you like maybe the Brandon Stark that was Brand the Builder yeah. was you all along. Mm-hmm. So he's been working forever. There's a chance that every Brandon Stark is has Brandon. been Brand. Yeah, which is so a cool, and, and it's a. I mean, zone. better than the nothing they did with Brand in the show. Yeah, I think Brand has everything to do. I think he's going to add like a almost like meta fictional aspect to the text and also yeah. it's very twilight zone and george loves twilight zone and he wrote some of the best episodes of twilight zone in the 80s i would love to have an episode of or a chapter of game of thrones that is introduced to us by i don't know who would be a good candidate for this jamie who is like in a world that seems to be normal we see a family and the- <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. Oh my <laughs> exactly god. Like oh, uh, Bran is the Night King. I actually love that theory. Um, if there is a Night King, I, which I I don't know. I think you have to have some sort of figure. Some sort of leader. So, okay, wait, by the time where we are in Dance with Dragons, I can't remember in the show if the show had mm. shown us a Night King esque thing yet. They have. Like at this because point, they should, we're in yeah. that's a very TV thing to do as well. Like having the, the face of evil. Yeah, we need. But I couldn't remember if they care. introduced that after we were off book or like it was like overlapping well, they, with book. So they definitely showed him at Hardhome. 
And I think they probably showed him before that. I don't think the Night King was shown season in five. during. No, it was not shown in the first four seasons for sure. So, so that was season five. So was there it was at hard home when you first see him. Yes. So I and that's the first time we see non whites. Like we see kind of like that. Honor but also, guard. like we don't yeah. really see hard home in the book. You don't see it at all. You so get like bits and pieces through letters. That's what I mean. Book. So like it's in it. That's what I mean. Like it's in it, but you don't like see it. And so if there is a place for them to show it, it would be something that technically maybe he was at hard home, but we didn't see it. Yeah, I the mean book. they don't even really tell you exactly what happened to hard home. Like you know that like a really bad storm went through it, but you don't know for sure that it was like, yeah, the Night King showed up with a, a hundred thousand yeah. white walkers, took it over. And it's totally different than the show Hard Home because John's not there, the Night Watch isn't there. Like none of that was the same. Yeah. And Hard Home is uh one of John's kind of uh blunders mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Uh because uh ranging has not worked at this point and he still continues to do it. Uh it shows the inexperience that he has for sure. Yeah. He's 14. Uh, yeah. No, exactly. I think he's 16 in dance, right? Or 15. But it goes back to the yeah. whole like he's young, he's super young. Most of these people are kids. And they're in places of power and they don't make the right decisions. And the adults all. act like children. So, oh, I really oh, like, we'll talk about Jano Slint later. I really like what Derry said. I think Hodor will hold the Black Gate under the Night Fort, which is why a tear falls on Bran when they go through it. And that is very called out in the text when, uh, when you read that, that a tear falls uh, and Bran thinks about that. That's whew. And so we will see... this, so will this be, um, Bran and the Reeds getting to the wall and Hodor holding the gate. Is that what we're it, saying? It could be, but I think Jojen is Jojen paced. I think that uh, Jojen oh, yeah. is dead. I think that that's pretty obvious and it's yeah. kind of sad. It's yeah. messed up too. It's very Lovecraftian for sure. Um, Here will be there though. It's okay. Uh, do we just want to talk about Bran? Because like I think Bran's chapters, while they're very few, are some of the coolest stuff. Like it's what is also, I mean, yeah. I think that's why it gets abandoned in the shows because it is the, the most sort of like conceptual yes. out there. Yeah, and it requires a lot of explaining. Yes. Uh, and there's a lot of exposition from uh, Blood Raven in this, and, and we see Brennan Rivers in a tree, a part of the Weirwood Network. Who we're it's so awesome that we're reading Duncan Egg next because yep. we're going to see Blood Raven in that book. Yep. Or in those books, I should say. And um, he is, he's not quite just a man sitting in a, th- a tree throne, as in the show. Like, he is, like, part of that tree. Yeah. He has grown into it. I think that's why I like the cover of uh, The Howling Dark so much, is it because it's, like, the tech version. Yeah. yeah. I like that a lot. That's a good point. I actually Stop. have that book right here. For anyone who doesn't know, it's a uh, dude, like, tied into all these it, tubes and shit. you can't really see the background but it's like a bunch of wires like going i mean honestly i think that's what i when i saw it like it i think yeah, i don't know subconsciously it reminded me of that yeah, for sure um i have a piece of the last uh part of brand's first chapter um it says mirror's gloved hand tightened around the shaft of her frog spear who sent you who is this three-eyed crow and they're talking mm-hmm. to cold hands a friend dreamer wizard called him what you will the last green seer the long hall's wooden door banged open outside the night wind howled bleak and black the trees were full of ravens screaming cold hands did not move a monster brand said the ranger looked at brand as if the rest of them did not exist your monster brandon stark Calls him Brandon. Uh, yours, the raven echoed from his shoulder. Them. Outside the door, the ravens in the trees took up the cry until the night would The echoed. raven on his shoulder is Benjen. Oh, what if? Uh, echoed to the murder song of yours, yours, yours. Jojen, did you dream this? Mira asked her brother. Who is he? What is he? What do we uh, What do we do now? We go with the ra- ranger, Jojen says. Uh, we have come too far to turn back now, Mira. We would never make it back to the wall alive. We go with Bran's monster or we die. First off, that's some good Good horror horror. writing. Like that is the shit folks. That is, that's about as good as it gets. Um, There's a lot to unpack there. Like calling him a monster, Brandon Stark. Why is he called the green seer and not the three eyed crow? Are they two different people? I don't know. Shit's dope. Because he's not the director, yeah, right? It gets me so hyped. <laughs> hey, uh, Jimmy, are you a fan? Of these I books? I I enjoy these books. <laughs> I love. I've cool. always. I've it's cool watching. too. Like 
real quick before you get into that point, just the fact that Brand, so because I'm looking at the, like the chapter breakdown, Brand's the fourth chapter in the book, and then you don't get another Brand chapter for a while. <laughs> but we see Brand in another chapter. It's like another 10 chapters before you actually get like a Brand POV again. But like, uh, it's interesting to me that I, I always, or in my mind at least, like the most sort of like out there and conceptually bizarre are Brand and Arya on mm-hmm. like opposite mm-hmm. ends of the like world. And Definitely it's interesting like that the show, the show abandoned Bran, but embraced Arya's weirdness. And like, I don't know why narratively. They because I feel like they, they embraced Arya's re- weirdness to a point. And then it became just, I wear a mask and I kill people. Yes, and it did become very it. Mission Impossible where you just like, and it's actually yeah. Tom Cruise. <laughs> so they took like the very like dumb route for that. And then they kind of did the same thing with Bran where they were like, okay, this is getting really weird and we don't want to lose an audience. What do we do? I don't know. Just have him be and a what's fucking weird robot. Is and that the audience the loves the weird stuff. So yeah, I mean they, but I mean that's the show in general. I feel like at least post like season two, season three, really cut out a lot of the more fantastical elements outside of like Lady the, Stoneheart. Where's yeah. she at? Yeah, I mean Stoneheart. <laughs> you've got I mean everything with Karth, which was super weird. Like just. House of the Undying. Yeah. Oh yeah. All the all the prophecy stuff, all the weird magic, like anything to do with Euron or Victorian, because he was cut. Like so much that they just didn't do. Yeah. But. And and a lot of the children of the forest stuff they tried to force in, but to, mm-hmm. to what end, I'm not sure. I actually really like what Oso says, says I think the theory where the children of the forest killed and made Jojen into pace, which oh, yeah. I think is canon. Yeah. Uh and they're just using brand for their own ends. I think the children of the forest have so much more to do oh, in yeah. this story. Uh for and sure. yeah, Arya murdering a bunch of phrases is definitely the, the that shit. cold open was awesome. So I mean, feeding him his children so was sick. fantastic. So sick. I totally get behind that. But it's that. the best way to use the dumb version of the Arya Well, it's, yes. it's also the Wyman Manderly uh, Frey Pies that we get in this book. Yeah. Where he starts feeding them, you know, he's feeding yeah. them some Freys. Oh, the Frey Pie is so good. Wyman Manderly is the MVP of Dance with Dragons. He's so jolly and big. I love him. It's a red face. He's just fat as shit. He's great. I love him. <laughs> it's everything I want to be when I'm 50. Just I'm strong. sorry, you want to be nobody stars, eat bro. at Jimmy's house when he's 50. <laughs> I want to feed you all your family. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we talked about Brand seeing uh, Duncan old man in the Weirwood. He also sees uh, some old Stark history in the Weirwood as well, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then on top of that, we see that he's working into Hodor more frequently, which we know from the prologue is a very bad thing. Uh, in this Which even without the prologue, I think all of us would like instinctually be like, I, mm, that doesn't seem okay. Very uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very uncomfortable. And I think it starts to show Bran in a different light. Uh, which, to be fair, if you were crippled, but it does ability, also even villain origin story. I like that it also troubles the sort of like notion of like body on top, body autonomy. And like, hmm. we've generally thought, like, yeah, then you could like work into an animal. But like, when we put it in human terms, you're like, oh, but that, okay, but that's not right. And you're like, is it right with an animal? Wow. Yeah. No, but they're animals. So who cares? All right. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that, that's actually a really good way to look at that. I like that a lot. Brand- but I mean, there's there's such a theme of like slavery and it, is it good and is it bad? And can you even think of it as good and bad? Because like, what is good and bad? And like, if taking over a body is like having possession of that body is the ultimate form of slavery. And so like warging is like enslaving this body for your own personal use. Yeah, for sure. Jimmy, were you saying that the, the weirwood paste... Is that what you were referring to when you were talking about? Oh, yeah. Jojen goes like missing. Jojen. I was like, where's Jojen? Yeah. And then he's eating some paint. I mean, it's definitely Jojen. It like dude. opens his powers and like lets him see shit. Yeah. It's definitely it's another green seer. You yeah. know, I, it makes a lot of sense. And it's really disturbing when you think about it. And again, Bran is now cannibalizing his friend. It, it Yeah. Bran's kind of turning into a monster. And we hear it opens him up his eyes, though. We talk about cold hands becoming a monster. Like maybe Jojen was a necessity to open up that third eye like you have I mean, to I have think Jojen knew that, that though right because ever since they met Jojen kind yes. of was like that weird like I'm like going to die like, yeah <laughs> yeah like, I'm here for you and then I'm gone very like, ominous, <laughs> very disturbing 
and also I live on in you because you're gonna eat me. <laughs> <laughs> eat me. I'll be with you forever, Brandon. Like what? I think that it's a uh, sacrifice. Is Brand big... turns into the thing from the Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> eat me. <laughs> <laughs> I think sacrifice is obviously repeated over and over with uh, R'hllor, um, with other other things in this, right? Um, so I think that that would kind of work in the way magic works in the world. So yeah, and that's the the last. We only get three brand chapters, but he shows up in Theon's chapter. Yeah, he is. At, d- He's so pivotal in Theon becoming Theon again and switching. I was gonna from say Reek. you mean Reek. Well, yeah, well, he starts out as Reek, and then halfway through the book, you get the first Theon chapter, and you're like, ah. Which also, like, that. I was gonna yeah. briefly like just like mention that I like um, how in the later books we start playing with the naming of chapters and I how like it. yes, um, and I know it's partially teeth, right? like. I know that it's partially like a publishing thing of keeping it secret who the POVs are, because if you obscure it, then like people can't be like, oh, that's going to be a POV. Yeah. Um, like, I know that's part of the reason, but also creatively from like, a let's fr- pretend publishing doesn't exist and that doesn't exist. Like the way that he play- like, like we talked before about the way that like he trusts the reader to accept that Elaine is Sansa and is not yeah. explaining it to us because like she has to be Elaine yeah. in her own mind and in the reader's mind. And just in general about how he even like he started doing that a bit and is like fully leaned into like naming the chapters after who this person is in this moment versus who they are. Oh, yeah. I mean, because you get was it it's in this one, right? The blind girl. Yeah. Like you get an Arya chapter called yeah. the blind girl. And then she gets her vision back. It's really maximizing your your you know storytelling whenever you're using mm-hmm. every single facet of, of what you write down with your pen. I, I love that stuff. For sure. So I guess that's Bran. Oh, I mean, I mean, what else do we want to say about Bran? I feel like a lot of it's like future state. You know, ban, ban, ban this guy in the chat. What is, I am Wesley. What a, what a doofus. <laughs> what a weird thing. <laughs> what a dork. What a dork. What a what a I don't, I don't yeah, so I feel like a lot of the a lot of the brand stuff. Who knows, like what kind of payoff we'll get that's different than what we got in the show. Well, who has a better story than Brand oh, Broke? Um, <laughs> Jesus, I there's a lot more to Brand than we got. Well, the thing is, like the who has a better story. I mean, in the books, like probably <laughs> insanest story. I fully agree. But in the show, like I'm sorry, what was his story? Did he have a story? <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, because again, though, to be fair, so we're reading book five and it ends with him meeting the three I crow. Well, he's in there for a while because he gets. Oh, I know. But like, think about like, that's where we leave off in the books with Bran. Yeah. And then everything in the show is based on notes that Gurm possibly gave them or them making it up. Yeah. So it's like. And And they leaned away from the fantastical, which brand embodies the fantastical. And also I would, I would say for people who like to crap on a song, he is the history of this world. That's why the night King wants to kill him. But that's why he is the night King. I don't don't know. And that's why he, no, 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 no. There is a night King and there's There's the night King. I, I think that Bran is, a lot of hope in the show. I mean, George basically takes a crippled boy and is, is giving him a totally different Why? role than you would expect. Why? <laughs> God. All right. We're not in the veil. Calm down. Oh no. <laughs> I was thinking of the dreams where the crow tells him to fly. Cause he yeah. can't Yeah, but you made it sound like fly. a little dipshit from the veil. Like, I'm trying to sound like a crow. <laughs> I mean, lo- I mean, is there an echo there between like telling Bran to fly and Robin being like, I want him to fly, <laughs> mommy. Is Robin Rhaegar? Like, that's what I really <laughs> stop. stop. <laughs> no, like, is he Taisha? Button. He's definitely Taisha. I, I, <laughs> I have to pee real quick. I'll be right back. Don't talk about anything cool without me. Talk about Red Rising or some shit. All right, I'll do the uh, countdown again. <laughs> So we can talk about Sunny in her three because Jimmy hasn't heard that yet. <laughs> yeah, I have the um, the arc finally, but I don't know if I want to read it because I didn't even get to everything that I was supposed to read this month. So that's why, like, I never request arcs because I'm so busy reading with things that are published. Like, what I'm supposed to yeah. pre-read stuff? Like, I don't got time. For that. <laughs> but like, it's Kingdom of Death is sitting here. And stop! Read no, it. wait. <laughs> wait. I want to read it. Um, 
You're just going to have to wait for the fridge. next one anyway. Yes, just like when I disappeared last stream. No, but he'll actually come back. So Unless he falls in the toilet. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. So who who have we talked about so far? So we kind of went through most of Tyrion. Um, Danny. I, we didn't wrap up Danny. I don't. But... I think we talked about Danny like incident. We he just said let's talk about Marine, is what Jim we Bob didn't said. Danny stuff because we didn't talk about Sons of the Harpy. We didn't talk about the pit. We, we didn't, didn't talk, talk about, about the assassination attempt. We didn't talk about what she's like seeing at the end of her. So mm -hmm. we're basically we're talking about it now. So we can't do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so not that. Um, <laughs> also, anyone read for I met, Scott? Really I meant I don't know if I want to read it right this second because i already have it pre-ordered and i'm potentially waiting until jimmy's getting the rich. very end of march and or the beginning of april but i have the arc sitting right in front of me and Stop i want it. it you're being a gentleman and waiting <laughs> <laughs> all right so we were going back to danny for a second because we didn't actually finish talking about danny Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we kind of just touched on it a little bit. We kind of yeah. talked about like our overall thing, but because Jimothy said that we should talk about Marine, but not about Danny. Yeah, my bad. I, I, I went on my I was going to go my Quentin rant. Uh, camera blurry. Stop you know, it. Danny. Is that the force, Alex? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> you can fly in space at, with that. Um, <laughs> this is not the left choice you're looking <laughs> In the first chapter of Danny, she thinks about the red door. And bravos yep. uh and the house of the undying as well i think the red door it has some more symbolism than we realize and i don't know what that is yet and i don't think any theories really have it um planned out either but the red door is my parents house has a red door God, he's talking about Lena's parents my house. parents are secret targaryens actually i do tell my mom all the time uh brief, brief aside my mom was born in the year of the dragon and she like super identifies with that for some reason like hmm. it's a, a, it's ridiculous so i buy her dragon stuff all the time and like she never she started graying when she was like 18 and she like never colored, colored her hair so she has like silver hair and ha oh. always has had silver hair so i was like mother of dragons that's you <laughs> and she loved it yeah, she has like a Targaryen blanket and like. That's cool. <laughs> so my mom is like not so secretly a Targaryen. <laughs> Another amazing theory. <laughs> we have come full circle. Everyone is a Targaryen, including but, real life people outside of Westeros. But somehow she ended up with a Stark for a daughter. Who saw that coming? <laughs> Derry said the red door is simply a symbol of safety, simplicity, home, and family. And I think that it's obvious that that that's what it is to Danny. But I think it has to have some other. Uh, like is there George, any other reference to like a red door that we could connect it to somewhere else that she's going to encounter it? Not that I've found, but the one thing uh, that I do know is that the, supposedly she was in Bravos and there's a lemon tree outside the red door, and there there or, are no lemon trees in Bravos. Is it a red door insofar as like your path like through to something, which is what a doorway is, you know, getting to something, and red is the color of like blood and death, and that her door to whatever is oh, wow is fire blood. and blood. Fire wow, and blood. I. That's awesome. I do like how she explained what a door is, by the way. <laughs> Terry, why are you yelling at me? <laughs> I don't know if you know what a door is, but. <laughs> yeah, Oso says the lemon tree. Yeah, so she talks about remembering a lemon tree, but there is no, there are no lemon trees in Bravos. It's impossible for them to grow there, uh, which makes people think that Danny was actually not in Bravos, and she thinks she was. Like they didn't. And tell Sansa's her favorite dessert is lemon cakes. <laughs> Damn. So Sansa's a secret lemon tree. <laughs> yes, that's what that means. <laughs> Wait, Sansa has red hair and she loves lemon cakes. She She's the red door. Red door. <laughs> yes, there are lemon trees in Bravos. I don't. I, wherever Danny was supposed to be housed, I mean, there's there's entire threads built on this. I don't know why Derry's yelling at me so much. Hey, <laughs> calm down. Uh, so yeah, we talked about Quaith uh danny talks about herself being a monster just like dario and her dragons we talk about the assassination attempt we didn't talk about where she ended up in the like yeah the assassination attempt is very interesting because it ties in the barristan pov because i i everyone knows i love barristan but he uh thinks it's his dar and i don't i don't think it's his dar i don't think it makes uh, any sense that it's his dar because uh, he he got his, his power? 
he got his piece and he's right yeah. next to her. And then the person that uh, gets the confession out of his dar's man is shave pate and shave pate was directly affected by the, uh, the fighting pits being closed. So I feel like it's shave pate. And I think shave pate is kind of like the little finger of Marine. And I think Barristan's POV will be the one that he was the peace breaker because Danny actually got peace. Like, and it doesn't really make yeah. any yeah. sense. The harpy are happy. The harpy are good. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't make sense for his daughter to uh, endanger that by killing her off, especially being right next to her, handing her the locust. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. So and are we saying that uh, Barristan is not going to die in a hallway fighting a bunch of peasants with <laughs> golden masks on? No. Okay. No, I do good. not. Um, I think I think that Barristan uh, shows a lot of question he's questioning himself like yeah am i sure it's his dar like if you read his pov it's all over there so i do not think that his dar is um the the person who did the poisoning at all and do i think, think when Danny his dar like suspected and knew about it was complicit in that way no i don't i actually don't i think his dar thought that he got exactly what he wanted which was the piece and danny made her piece and obviously it, it pained her tremendously um i think that it is probably either shave pate um or someone else because we also but i mean like it's not i was gonna say like uh, i don't disagree that it's also very possibly not his dar but it's not impossible like it's not like his situation does not makes it impossible for him to feel like he'd benefit from her death because as it's as they say like he might feel okay i got her to marry me everyone legitimized this marriage i know she's kind of a loose cannon and she could change her mind and decide to like do shit with her dragons it's easier if i just like okay i'm legitimately the ruler because i married her Let's let her be dead now so that I can just like be in charge without her messing things up. So it's not like he has no motivation to kill her. He does a bit. Sure. Yeah. I, but I think also that he could ride this to Westeros. Uh, I think that that's a, a viable path for him. But I, I, I don't know. He's right there, which is weird. Shave Pate isn't there during the poisoning as well, which is a little weird. And Barrison thinks about all these things. Um, and he has a bias against his dar. He clearly. And then, I mean, I mean, him. to your point, I mean, like, I'm not saying it's not impossible that it's not oh, yeah. his dar. I'm just saying like, it's not so easily that like, it can't be like, it could be like, there's a, there's yeah. a legitimate reason to think he would do it. But I mean, the fact that he's like, well, I don't, and they're like, why would you offer her those and not eat them yourself? And he's like, oh, well, they don't agree with me. So anyone who knows that would be like, oh, I'll poison the thing that he's definitely not going to eat. Like that also makes sense. So like, but I don't him. think it's like easily like it can't be him. Like it's it's reasonable that it could be him. I agree with you. I think that um, both are options. There, there's a ton of options. And I think that that's the important thing is that this is a very, very clever thing George does with Barrison's POV where we just we could take the information out at front. Right. But I, I don't think that that um, even if it ends up being that like we still could have questioned it, which is fun. But what do we think of the choice, even though Danny has primarily been our POV character that he decides to withhold Danny's POV mm. um, and just make us be like, is she alive, dead? Where is she? Pretty like, bold. That, like, we are also like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And she's actually just uh, she has diarrhea and uh, <laughs> it's not going well. I feel you, girl. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> within a 48 hour window, day, by the way, in the book, uh, young. 16 she's like eight no she's like she's no eight. she's little she is like 12 wait is she eight no she's, no, she's, she's like very little danny's age almost she's younger but, than danny but danny kind of like treats her like she's a child <laughs> so i'm just like bro you're like six months older than her yeah they're a little young over there marine eh? <laughs> but i think marine uh, not marine uh i think she is like, con like a, a lot younger than danny like at least a, a couple of years like she's she's very young. Yeah, and Danny's fourteen like at the end of dance, so that would mean she. Yeah, there was she, a moment too where I was reminded of how old she was because Danny like reflects on oh, and she's like thus and such that, age, yeah. and I was like, oh my god, yeah, she is like a little little kid. She's like, like when I was a child, and we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you're still a kid, but uh, yeah. she's not in a position to be a kid anymore, which yeah. is, I think, kind of part of the point. But but it, it is it, also like it, yeah, she's like eight or nine, yeah. Right. Um. And so, like, there's moments, like, the kinds of advice that she gives Danny and the kind of conversations she's privy to, you're like, you're not even double digits yet. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And all the awful things being, you know, a slave before that she probably saw is pretty rough. And uh, it makes sense that there's an attachment between Danny and her. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's a pretty natural relationship. But thinking of Miss Ande is that age and then Grey Worm. Not not same. Yeah. 
I'm not saying. Yeah. <laughs> so are we saying that Grey Worm and Masande aren't going to fall in love? And Maybe in it? like book 12. <laughs> I wonder if you get a Grey Worm POV. What do you think? I feel like they Why? made him a bigger deal in the show because the actor who played him was a people really liked that actor. And it so he became done, a yeah. bigger part. I don't think he's ever going to be a POV. I don't think he's going to be that big of a character, honestly. I, I agree. I think there's already enough POVs. Now you have Tyrion, Barristan, who I, I mean, even in the die. show, he wasn't he didn't do anything very important. It was just that people liked that actor. And then they decided yeah. to start shipping Missande and Grey Worm. And they're like, yeah, let's yeah. give him that. Yeah, it's kind of like Braun as well. I mean, Braun yep. uh, had high ratings, so they kept him on. And, and you know, that's stuff that's going to happen with TV. I actually don't think Masandi or uh, is it Masandi or Masandi, whatever. Um, well, how does Roy say it? <laughs> it's the opposite of whatever. He's Wait, was it in there. this book that Roy called Brienne Brian? Well, Brian. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> I was like, it was this one. Yeah, he did say Brian, like straight up. <laughs> he like literally said my middle name. You didn't want to do that one again. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm good. He's on Dallas. They know who I mean. <laughs> Poor guy, dude. All right. Can we talk about Quentin? Can we talk about the yes. Frog Prince? Yes. Dude, the opening line of his POV, adventure stank. <laughs> Fantastic. George told us exactly how this was going to go right from the get go. He's so good at opening chapters. <laughs> Oh man. Um, do you guys like the uh, uh, Quentin arc or no? It is pointless and it doesn't belong in the book and they should take it out. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, it's fine. I, I enjoy it. I, I don't think that everything has to have this massive payoff for the personal POV. I think this is very much a plot mover to kind yeah. of show what's happening. Uh, there's a uh, there's a plot in Malazan called Red Mask, and I'll just leave it at that for no spoilers. And people always bring up Red Mask and go, that was the dumbest thing ever. Why did we have that? And I thought it was great. And it's funny because I also think Quentin's great, and I think they're very similar. Uh, in the world well, playing out to bring up my favorite uh, before they are hanged has a comes. pointless thing I for the it. entire book. Love it. And like, I think it's fantastic. Personally. But like, also, is it ultimately entirely pointless for the plot? No. And the characters, because it's not yeah. for the characters. They're impacted and the characters that we met in feast are going to be massively impacted by how Quentin uh, ends up. So. I mean, Miss arguably, Anderson everything that Ned did is pointless because he got his head cut off, so it doesn't matter. He yeah, he went and died. It is weird, though. You're, you're right. We get Ned for one book, and people don't complain. You get Quentin for one book, and they go, it's pointless. It's because people got attached to Ned. You get a little bit more of Ned. And you have Ned's family that you're, like, very attached to. And yeah. all of the family is still living with the grief of that. Yeah. But it's I, also, like, that was a book one, so you kind of felt like Ned was going to... And be, like, Ned's death there. did start, like, ten wars. Versus yeah. Quentin, who's just like, mm, sad. I did feel bad for Quentin, and I think it's definitely a... Uh, but he didn't start the, like, War of the Million Kings. <laughs> yeah, it, it, they, it's definitely Gurm dumping on the Prince Charming a bit, right? I mean, for sure. I like it. I dig it. You know, Danny gets, you know, I, I, in theory is going to be offered marriage from, like, a Dornish prince who is not her relation, mm -hmm. or Griff, who is her relation, and one, yeah. well, but he's dead now, so gonna go with incest. <laughs> the only option left. <laughs> Dorn's interesting because it has so many side POVs in a lot of ways. Like we get another area Hota POV mm -hmm. and we see that uh, Tyene, I think is her name, is going to infiltrate the Sparrows, which is kind of sick. Wild. Nymeria is going to join the council and Balon is going after Darkstar. Um, and this is kind of where you can see that I'm not so convinced that Darkstar is the one that cut Marcella's ear off. Um, but uh, this is all like Really big stuff. And I think, again, this would be cooler reading it if we had wins. Like, yes. we, we would need this. Oh, yeah. And this as Derry said, uh, he points out the fairy tale comparison with the frog prince. Yes. Yes. The frog is obviously really good symbolism uh, going back to all or of not, I mean, it is symbolism, but it's more just sort of like, a, in case you missed what I'm doing here, literal fairy tale connection. Yeah. <laughs> I love that stuff. And, and uh, Gurm wears all of his um, influences on his sleeve. Pretty, pretty heavy for sure. So the Dorn stuff's great. I love it. Yeah. Uh, and, and the Quinn stuff's going to have a major repercussions. And I actually, I, everyone shits on area Hota POVs, but I, I don't know. I've always liked the man in arms at the side of somebody 
like telling the story. I'm reading uh, the Warlord. Well, I mean, honestly, there's a lot of that because you have Barristan, you have Davos, you have Ariohota. Davos is a great example. Yeah. Sam is like the non armored version of that to John. Like, you have a lot of that. And then Samwell even extends out on his own at some point. Um, Also, it's Davos. (laughs) Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that either. I don't understand why people are so adverse to that. Well, I think um, it's more just to do with like it's another new perspective that people are like sick of. Like, I want my takes old away favorites. From the main cast. They're like, I want to yeah. hear about John and I want to hear about Tyrion and who's this guy. Well, I said this to Alan because uh, me, me and Alan, like the first time me and Alan ever talked, actually, I brought him on because he said he hated feast and dance. And I said, come on, we'll we'll talk about it. So I, mean, I would have said that before this reread, and now. Yeah. <laughs> then you, if you take it for what it is, I think it's really good. Like I, dance to me is almost as good as Storm of Swords for me because I think it's a very difficult book to write. I think a Storm of Swords might be the easiest book to write uh because of how how much good shit he did in the first two books. I mean, obviously there's a lot of groundwork to get there and then actually executing that's fair. Well, so even though feast is called feast, like, I mean, the metaphor that I would use for like storm is like you spent all of these hours cooking Thanksgiving dinner and storm is like we're getting to eat it now. Like you t- you put in the work in the previous two books yeah. and storm is just like we eat it now. Um, yeah. And that's like the easy part. And I think the winds of winter. Is that's fast. what winds is going to be. Yeah. Winds that's- is going to be the next big payoff book. And then dream should be more falling ish i think think, uh dream would be the bow on the nope it's going to be setting up the next five books probably (laughs) probably um but i what if he's like psych dream of spring is called that because it's a dream make it up for yourself it's a dream oh god roseanne wakes up at the end that'd be so (laughs) bad i'd be so upset um they were dead the whole time (laughs) stop (laughs) It's all been Brand's coma dream from when he fell out of the tower. Yes. That would be the worst thing ever. I wouldn't even be shocked. I hate it so much. That's why he has the best story because this whole thing was he created story. all his <laughs> I think Dark Star is in league with Doran and Balon is riding into a trap. Derry, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I think Dark Star, yeah, I think the whole thing was set up. Dark Star's being also, promised. Also, Balon is in the morning. Ne- is it what? nincompoop oh yeah he, he big dumb he big dumb <laughs> like oh you're not very bright i'm trying to think of like the other subsequent uh so asha we get we get our asha yeah. however you want to say asha um gets a piece of theon's skin from ramsey which was pretty disgusting I think yara oh sorry yara i'm glad honestly that's a good change because asha and osha is is a little I, I i was so confused oh, because i remembered like you know how asha meets theon and how she mm-hmm. doesn't she pretends she's not his sister and i was like oh this is that part and then she said her name was yara and i was like oh it's not that part because that's not asha yep and then it took me a long time like oh but it is but we call her yara what? Because <laughs> those <laughs> dumb Americans can't understand Asha and Osha are different people. Also, because like Asha's not even in it that much at that point. She's, she's not. like hard, she's not even in it at all. So like she's who would barely be in the book. They're in hiding. So it's like whatever. And like no one was confused about Tyrion and Tywin, and those names are like virtually the same. I mean, not to mention all the Targaryens that are actually named the same. <laughs> Megar, Megar, Megar. Only when it's female characters that are named similar things, like, oh, no one will be able to tell these apart. Yeah, we won't be able to figure this out. There's no way. I'm going to start a secret Umber conspiracy. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, the Battle of Deepwood Mott, I thought was short, but really well written. I really enjoyed it. And also Asha being with Stannis as like a prisoner yes. of war. Pretty wild. I forgot about that. How many chapters did we get of her? Was it just two? I think. Yeah. Two. Because the first one we got was. We find out she's been married off from your own bride, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, she's uh, with someone else. <laughs> she's doing other things. <laughs> yep. Uh, in a very George fashion, which is. Oh, yeah. Gross. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's Asha it's... and Carl the maid <laughs> is the name. I have sex on Galbert Glover's bed. The boy's got stamina. What can you, what can you say? You know, I mean, come on. Oh, man. I guess we can jump to our brother and talk about Theon, right? So we'll the, go from Reek to Theon. Yeah, Re- Reek, the disturbing. Like, Are we done with Asha? You have anything? Squid Game. Squid Game. 
Oh. There's literally a moment where someone says, is this some squid oh. game? Oh, oh my And I was God. like, same <laughs> universe, mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's west of Westeros. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yikes, yikes, yikes. Okay, so Reek. Where even the... So... <laughs> I think the books are even like more disturbing in his torment and torture than they're the show. less graphic but more disturbing. They like I feel like I think you... the thing that it makes something disturbing isn't gore, it's the psychological part of it. Yes. Because mm-hmm. like he's constantly just like I have to obey him. He's like and, and he's even the times the... when like Roose Bolton is trying to use him and he's like Yeah. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. He's so messed up. He's like, this is all set up. <laughs> weak, weak, it rhymes weak. I love ultimate PTSD the repetition of him rhyming words with reek is so great and he does it with uh jane he changes it every time too. as well right yeah, jane, yeah. jane it rhymes with rain or whatever he says um and then the physical aging of him is also the way he's described he sounds like amen yeah let's say someone with psd germs are really exceptionally well yeah I've, I've heard that said before i've seen people but also the way it. that like the reaction to how bad off he is that like it's it shows a lot. It's it's great characterization for Roose Bolton, his reaction to it, because yeah. like he is dismayed by it, but not because he thinks it's wrong, not because mm-hmm. he thinks that this is like you don't do this to your fellow man. It's more like, sir, I can't trust you because you done went too far. I can't use this. Yeah. <laughs> so you're like, oh, OK, I know exactly what kind of person you are. I Ramsey didn't fall too far from the tree. He mm-hmm. just fell a little crazy from the tree <laughs> and Bruce Bolton uh, raped his mom right yeah uh, well like, I mean like rape as awful as that is isn't it is a very like uh, uh pedestrian kind of evil versus like Ramsey is like a different level like that is because Ramsey also evil. rapes but then like takes joy in slowly torturing a person into like a mental break <laughs> like, and, like what is it about the naming of the is it the names of the dogs or the names of women that he's like abused or vice versa? Yeah. Um, I can't remember which way it goes, but it's interesting also that like the original reek is mentioned mm-hmm. and, and Roos says, I don't know if Ramsey corrupted reek or if reek corrupted Ramsey. Yeah. Weird. And, and the original reek was very clean. He, mm-hmm. he, he smelled good. He always bathed. He was like too clean. We he was clean, it. but he didn't smell good. That was the thing he did. smell. It? Like oh, he yeah. he would bathe all the time, but he just like had bo. Yeah, he yeah. had like that milky smell. This reek though, like when they bring him like in front of everybody, they're just like, ah, <laughs> like get this, just kill him already. Like why are you doing this? It's rough. And uh, Lady Dustin also is like disgusted by him, uh, which she's interesting because she hates the Maesters. Yep. And we get we kind of start to get a little suspicious of the Maesters in the Feast for Crows and George signposts again here. Uh, and also Lady Dustin wanted uh, Brandon Star or um, Benjamin. She was very, very or, no, I'm not sorry. Uh, Brandon, uh, Ed's older brother yeah. and goes on and on and on. It is Brandon, right? Am, am I remembering this right? I'm a little I'm or a little intoxicated. <laughs> the one that Catelyn was supposed to marry. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yeah, I'm I'm. This is bad. Um, I'm just going to Brandon. Whatever. I mean, Brandon. Yeah. Brandon, yeah. Brandon Stark. It's Brandon yeah. Stark. Yeah. Um, so she talks about him and that's where we get a little bit more of the kind of person that Brandon Stark was and that he was a womanizer, uh, which maybe plays into the fact that something happened with the Shara Dane at Harrenhal. Uh, there's a lot of like really good stuff that's packed into the Theon chapters and a lot of the Northern politics get flushed out through his POV as well, mm-hmm. uh, which I really like. Because he's just seeing it all. How good is Prince of Winterfell chapter? I don't remember it off the top of my head. So he's taking, uh, it, it's the dinner, and that's when uh, Anderley yeah. is feeding the phrase, and yeah. Roos is starting to fear that the like, there's a big uprising happening mm-hmm. between the phrase and the Manderleys and everyone that's there. Um, and then we see Theon go out into the yard, and he hears the Weirwood speaking to him, which is Bran. Well, like, I just think like weirdly, I feel like there's I, it's not I think I'm not going to try to argue that there's an intentional parallel here, but I feel like the relationship between Roos and Ramsey is reminiscent to me of Tywin and Cersei, whereas like you are a loose cannon that I cannot trust and that like yeah. you keep fucking this up and like they're you're she's like, I'm the heir to you and I'm as like 
in like into this and psycho and crazy and violent as you and like whatever but you're like no you don't get it you don't get why we need people to do certain things you don't get like how the public face of this affects us like you don't get it and i can't trust you to do it and like the way that rios feels about ramsey is like that where he's like you've gone too far you need we need to like court the good opinion of these people not because like oh we need to court the like no we need it we literally need it and i i don't trust you to do this hmm so just because I'm right. dumb and I can't remember it, d- does anybody actually believe that fake Arya was Arya? Like, do any of the Boltons actually think that? Or was that just? No, it's one of those things where it's like, you're not going to question it because it's the King's, de- it's the Lannister decree. Yeah. Um, yeah, but funny. they're not like, they, none of them thinks that that's true. So yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. I was just they're making in on it. Because I know that like uh, Theon Caesar, he, he's just like, that's not Arya. He's like, wait, wait, why do I know that? No, I'm Reek. Like, Theon would think that. No, I'm Reek. <laughs> that, that different mind framing from torture is, uh, it's definitely a real thing. Yeah. And it's written well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the brand piece is, uh, Theon, a voice seemed to whisper. His head snapped up. Who said that? All he could see were the trees and the fog that covered them. The voice had been as faint as rustling leaves, as cold as hate, a god's voice or a ghost. How many died the day that he took Winterfell? How many more the day he lost it? The day that the young Greyjoy died to be reborn as reek, reek. It rhymes with shriek. Dude, that's some great writing right there. Oh, yeah. oh Prince Winterfell is also when we get the very uh, uncomfortable moment of Ramsay uh calling reek in to warm up his new bride for him which was which was notably not sansa <sighs> yes because that made no sense <laughs> that was character assassination is what that was yeah, uh, but like just the just i mean that's as far as he took it but just the fact that like he puts theon as just destroyed as he is and ram's just like all right while i'm getting undressed like get that started for me it's just like what <laughs> Jeez. It's like a remote start. I mean, it's awful. And then Theon is like, but I can't because. <sighs> oh, the snip snip. <laughs> the the gray worm. <laughs> it's just one of those uncomfortable scenes. I mean, because there's like plenty of like rape scenes and stuff throughout the books. But that I don't know. That one in particular was just like, God damn, dude. Yeah, it was very um, because, and also like, the- again, like I said, like Ramsey raped somebody. I mean, uh, Roos raped somebody and yes. Ramsey was born, which like, again, takes I'm not that, downplaying like- that rape is a bad thing. But yeah. Ramsey takes everything to this like ridiculously sadistic uh-huh. level that like the thing you're doing is already bad, but you made it twisted. Yeah, I think that you could argue that Theon's and Theon to re transformation and that gothic kind of atmosphere, like claustrophobic, mm-hmm. as the winter storm rolls in, I, you could argue that that's the best, like encapsulated arc in the series. I, th- I really do uh, think you could. And also, like we love Winterfell, we love the the history that's went through, the people who came from there. I was just say Winterfell we- goes from being a place that you're like excited to return to to being like a, a house of nightmares, a haunted yeah. house. Yeah, it's, well, it's the, horror. Yeah, the part that Jimmy just mentioned was in the Ghost of Winterfell, which is like the next chapter after the the other what was it called the prince of winterfell yes it goes prince and then ghost and that's when uh what's his name uh rogers found dead and then they're like questioning reek of like he probably did it and they're just like look at him how the hell could he have done this like he can barely hold a dagger yeah right because he's missing fingers and <laughs> you um, have to be realistic you have to be, <laughs> he realistic. Couldn't have have to be realistic with these things night, night scott. scott take it easy buddy um yeah, I mean, I, I think that those chapters are amazing. And then we get the reveal that Mance is in Winterfell and we get the callback to the fact that he was in he Winterfell was yeah. when Robert visited. It's just... Mm, I had forgotten about that, honestly. When I got to those points, I was like, oh shit, he was there. Yeah, it's that. so good. Dude. Yeah. And like, we'll talk about with the John stuff, but like, you know, uh, um, uh, I'm forget, I'm blanking on his name now, but Rattle... Um, it's not Rattleclaw. Um, Rattle Neck. Is it Rattleneck? I can't remember. But the switch between him and Mance and who they burn and everything is so cool. Like so rattle. Good. Oh, what? Rattle chains? Like rattle shirt? I think it's rattle chains. Yellow dick? I know. Get- Derry knows. Derry, who is it? Something be rattling. There's a rattle there. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Baby rattle? Uh, also, uh, th- so we get Theon 
changing back into Theon, which yes. is really awesome. But what about Cersei and her shame walk and becoming something less than we've ever seen her before? Pretty wild, right? Well, I mean, even I think it's is it Kevin Lannister's perspective that's like she's come back now, and he like thinks to himself that normally like old Cersei would have talked back, but this yep. Cersei is like, yep, oh, sure. Yeah, whatever. Rattle shirt, by the way. Thank you. I mean, she's pretty broken at that point, but also she doesn't actually think that they're going to go as far as they do. And she keeps, she still tries to be like, all right, fine. I'm proud. Like, you can't break me down. It's like, yeah, we can. Yeah. And that becomes a very sympathetic moment for Cersei. But it is also like the, what is it coming home to roost? But like chickens coming, whatever the expression is. But like we talked about in Feast, where she's like, I'm going to arm them because that's fine. Uh And the entire Westeros is like, don't you know your history? Like, you should not do that. And now it's like, yeah, this is literally why you shouldn't do that. Look at what happened to you personally. Yeah. And we know she's not going to learn her lesson. (laughs) We know it. Do you think she blows up the Septa Baylor? I don't know. Probably not. But if she does, there would actually be ramifications for it. I mean, it's yeah. because the, the writers didn't know how to close the loop on all those plot lines. They're like, what if all of the mass die in one big in one spot. cinematic I, explosion? It was pretty good. I think I, I mean, I love the, the Light of the Seven, like that whole like intro. That song is fantastic. And I love it. I And I would love to see that happen in the books. And if it does, I just feel like there will actually be fallout from that. Not just Oh, I'm queen now. Well, also, you know what it is? And this is exactly how it's going to play out. We know Cersei's going to get out of it. She has the mountain, whatever might happen. Yeah. Uh, the people of, of uh, King's Landing are going to be in up uproar about yes. it. Whatever it is. Yes. They already don't like the, the Lannisters. Mm-hmm. Uh, young Griff is going to swoop in. S- swoop in. And he is going to win favor. Well, I mean, as Varys, Varys has been working towards, like, it's not really hard to present an alternative to the Lannisters that would be more appealing. Yeah. Not at all. The bar is quite low. <laughs> yeah. And I think that people will be very excited about young Griff. And uh, I, I see that is how he takes King's Landing. I don't think Cersei dies. I think Cersei ends up in Casterly Rock. And I think Tyrion and her resolve in Casterly Rock because that's been the very focal point for Tyrion Burn. in many months. Yeah. Yes. And he talks about burning it and things. Because so I, Targaryen. I mean, how much cooler is that? Like it's great. getting some actual POVs at the rock would be sick. Um, I, I also feel like Marjorie ends up getting beheaded. I could see well, her. So I was about to say, do you think the Tyrells are in the sept too, or is that just too much convenience? I think that Marjorie will try to marry young Griff as she's tried to marry every up and coming King. And this yeah. time she gets her head chopped off because she's, she's <laughs> Marjorie, <adorned>. thank you next. <laughs> yeah. She's right? the Jane Boleyn of, of Westworld. Oh, yeah. um, sure. And, you know, they even mentioned how her neck, I think Cersei talks about how her neck her would long be perfect neck. cut. Yeah. yeah. And that's a Boleyn uh, thing that's actually said in history. But Anne Boleyn, it wasn't, she married Henry VIII. Henry VIII is the one that had six wives. So she's uh, like the female Henry VIII? No, no, no. Uh, so Anne Boleyn was beheaded. Yeah. But like this whole notion of Marjorie having all these different dudes. Anne Boleyn only had Henry. Well, yeah, it's more so I think that she literally just represents her in that fashion. Like, I don't necessarily think she represents her as a like to a T, but like there's the whole long neck thing. And I guess uh, George is a pretty big fan of Henry VIII. Like he's a Henry VIII supporter because there's a lot of like supporter, not supporter, but he believes the hype behind Henry VIII, if that makes sense. Like there's a lot. (laughs) Henry VIII and Tyrion have a ton of of uh similarities as well uh i mean there's a reason so many films and books have been written about that period of history because it's fascinating but henry the eighth is like likely a syphilitic tyrant so yes but there are people who don't believe that that he has syphilis no that that he was a tyrant in a in a big bag of shit so that is a huge uh, there's a historical fiction writer named adrian dillard uh she's a very big fan of song of ice and fire and i had dinner with her and i talked to her about this and she's all in on Tudor stuff. Right. Um, and she was telling me about how Henry the eighth in that community is very controversial. And the people who are, I think he was great and people who think he was terrible. And she thinks that George falls into that. He thinks Henry the eighth was a great ruler. Now I don't know that for a fact. We don't know that for a fact. That's just her take on it. Um, I mean, I would I'd be very curious to hear the reasons just because like in terms of, okay, you can argue about like what personal interactions are like, but in terms of like what happened to the country, 
under Henry VIII. Oh, you know what it was? What he chose to do in terms of like splitting the church over wanting to marry somebody else. Like, I don't know how you argue for that being like, what a guy. (laughs) Yeah, there's there's a lot of points of contention. One of the biggest points of contention is whether or not he was disabled is actually one of the biggest points of contention of whether he not he had um, some sort of physical deformity or handicap. And that is where uh, she believes Gurm believes that. Whereas a lot of historians don't. Yes. And people believe that that is why he was so brash and so mean and awful. Uh, So that is it. I'm sorry. I was trying to remember it as I was saying it. Um, That sounds, yeah. I would love to talk. He would have like a sort of like a a complex about like trying to prove his macho because he has some kind Kind of of uh, like Tyrion in Dance of Dragons. I could buy that. Yeah. So because I mean, there is obviously a lot of speculation that he had syphilis because of how he seems to get crazier and crazier. Yeah, and kept so, killing more wives. <laughs> so it took a lot to get there. We'll I, I finally got there, <laughs> but I think Anne Boleyn, uh, like Anne Boleyn and uh, Marjorie, just their descriptions and stuff, kind of. Yeah, and, and so. what Jerry said, yeah, he did get a bit banged on the head, and, like personality yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, I think also he had a uh, club feet or club foot or something. I think club he foot. had gout. Gout. That's it. Gout sucks too. And also, like all the rich people had gout. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, so he said he took a head wound or some shit. <laughs> yeah, I know he did get a, a massive head wound that like was like he had CT intense. He had CT, guys. Chill. <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> That's all another discussion though, and I've always wanted to make a video on it. Is like Gurm's um, Tudor influences or all his historical influences? Yeah, there's I mean, so like, many. Before, not about Henry the Eighth as a person but just in terms of like the schism the religious schisms that occurred during his rule and the wars that started because of that and how you see some of that echoed in the kind of type of storytelling it's not obviously like a retelling of the Tudor era but the way that he plays with like the seven and then the like the puritanical version of the seven coming into power like feels Mm -hmm. very much like the Protestant takeover of Mm -hmm. like the Church of England yeah, and, and it's no surprise that this is in the books. Like when I see the sparrows pop up, I go, that makes perfect sense. But do you get this feeling of dread when they come in? I'm like, the sparrows, no. I'm like, the worst. No, I really enjoy when crazy religious zealots take over an entire... <laughs> like the Catholics were nice and corruptible. These Puritans, what can you do with yeah. them? <laughs> <laughs> um Here's all these religious crazies. Let's wait. So when in Westeros, are we going to see pilgrims travel to like Marine and decide that we discovered Marine that didn't exist before? And we're going to now colonize the Westeros. That's what's west of Westeros. So I mean, is going to conquer Marine. That's the origin story of Westeros. So the children of the force were already here. And the first men in the Andal, uh, all that stuff. Like it is the, uh, it is very similar to native Americans and, uh, you know, the good old uh, colonists. So discovering a place where people already live. <laughs> we don't like the way you're doing it. <laughs> it's new to me. It's new to me. Damn it. Um, oh, man. So then back to Theon. Just <laughs> Theon. We, we end with him. Speaking and of Jane crazy men. <laughs> jumping, jumping from the battlements, though, instead of obviously him and Sansa, because Sansa's yes. not there. But same ending. They escape and then that's like fade to black. You don't see him again. George did a great job of um, like really making me feel the bravery in that scene because I believed in the trauma. I was going to mm-hmm. say like the, the personal struggle in that moment. Theon is uh, hateable to say the least in, in the uh, first few books. Right. And it's a crazy how much I feel for him. And I, I don't want to well, because like as much of a prick as he was, he didn't deserve no one deserves like he, he deserves to die. Mo- it's it's hard to argue that he deserves the level of torment and physical. And well, I mean, like there's trauma. a reason that like there's laws against cruel and unusual punishment. Right. Yeah. No one would have minded if Rob took his head. If Rob exactly. had taken his head and I would have felt free, justified. We would have loved it. We would have yeah. rooted for it because it's our justice, right? You can't but, help but feel bad for him falling to the hands of people that like to flay in their spare time. One like, of the most diabolical people in in the series in fiction probably yeah and he's sitting there you know making apologies for it's like i've previously since i apparently like it's less of a first law night more of a red rising night i have previously compared ramsey and the jackal in red rising yeah Hmm. i could see it yeah yeah definitely Darius says that both reek and aria would rather risk death is excellent writing yeah aria chapters um 
man, they're, they're, they're as weird as brands in a lot of ways. And the house of the undying is set or no house of the undying. Oh my God. What? House of black and white. Yeah. Is, yeah. I, I love too that. many houses. Yeah. There were, there's too many. Come on, George. Uh, but also like quickly back to Theon's last reek. Um, I do like how, well, again, like the careful Theon's last reek. Slash reek. No. I thought you said Theon's last. I did reek. too. No, like he just had Theon's one last reek, reek in him. <laughs> yeah, it's all last reek. No, um, but like I feel like a, a narrative around like victims of kidnapping and torture are like, why don't you just run away? Like, why don't you leave? Yeah. And I feel like it's a very good illustration, a careful, patient illustration of why, like what that does to you mentally, and he why. It's a or like people who are in cults and things like yeah. that. You're like, why don't you just leave? Oh yeah. And you're like, because you can't. Because, because like it's not even like physically that you obvious. can't. It's not even like well you could physically run away. You could fit, like no you like it's not a matter of physical ability. And sometimes maybe it is. Maybe you're tied up. Maybe you're like mutilated. But also yeah. like it's like mind fucks you. Like you can't. Oh, 100 percent. And you already like he's already been through that, right? Like he thought he had an escape, and it was a trap. Oh. So every time after that, he's like, I'm not doing that shit again. Like this is clearly a setup. Like yeah. I'm not gonna have the go through this again. Yeah, it's very intentional by Ramsey. Mm -hmm. Very, very intentional. And he likes to play well, with his food. Ramsey is good at what he does. <laughs> yeah. You got to give it to him on that, I guess. Right? Totally. He's an artisan torturer. Yeah. Bespoke torture. Glockta would, would be proud. That's what I just said. Yeah. Except Glockta wouldn't be because Glockta's not sadistic. He's like, confess. You won't. God damn. Okay, I'll cut some fingers off. Will you confess? Well, he'd never let someone go. All day? So even Glockta would be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Because Glockton doesn't like enjoy to pro prolonged torture. Yes, he He's does. just like, he it's would like rather you just confess so we can just like get on with our day. Yeah. God, that makes me want to reread. <laughs> so good. There's always, always reread. Wow. All right. Yeah. So where are we going next? Uh, let's talk about Melisandre. 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 Um, her I first like POV Alan. was great. Yeah, I do sound like a genre. Genre. <laughs> is alan not the most quotable booktuber probably so quote I, I feel I, like he did not coin the phrase it's so good but every time i say it's so good i feel like I'm going out. because it's yeah. so good guys <laughs> it's so good let's get down to business i like how every stream i'm on just turns into me praising alan <laughs> it's the goat it's a, it's criminal might I don't understand nice. how he doesn't have a hundred thousand subscribers. I have no idea because it's YouTube and he's a booktube channel. It's silly. He there's other booktubers that have a hundred thousand that wish they could tie his boots and they can't like that dude. I love Alan, man. What a, what a, what a, he's the goat. <laughs> it was like George R. R. Martin. And then Sorry. Alan. <laughs> I just randomly just started praising <laughs> Alan. He's not going to watch this. That's true. He will not. Yeah, how dare you speak well of my nemesis in my presence? Hey, he still needs to read Six Across. <laughs> hey. He said yeah, he's reading it this month. Derry's trying to rein you in. Talk about Melisong. Sorry. Sorry. Genre. We're talking uh, about Alan of House Zandria. Oh my god. <laughs> you guys talk about Melisandre. I'm going to let my dogs out. I'll be right back. Who let the dogs well, out? Well, the fact we get her wow. PV is pretty great. Because she's like... <laughs> At this point, probably other than well, Brand becomes ma more magical in this book, but I would say she's the one we've seen doing magic and talking to a god. Um, and then we see her ask to see Azora High. But does the god talk back? Well, that's a good question because <laughs> she, when she asks to see Azora High, talking about she wants to see where Stannis is, she sees Jon Snow in the flames and then just ignores it, which I know a lot of people look at and they go, Oh, that's so stupid. So obvious. But what you just said, you know, if, if you have if you're conditioned to think one way, not just conditioned, but I mean, like people throughout history, like uh, interpret events to suit their narrative. Yes. So like if she's like full on committed to this is what she's going to go with. And this is what she's given a lot for the version of things being Stannis is the one. And like to challenge your own personal beliefs to that extent it takes a lot to go, you know what? I was wrong. I think it might be this. Prophecy. Yeah. Like people are more likely to be like, are my, sh is there any way it could still be the thing that I thought? Is there the smallest chance? Yes. Okay. I'm going with that then. <laughs> yeah. And also she has confirmation bias because she's actually been right about a couple things that we've seen so far. Uh, well, she's mainly been right about things that she's caused. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so she like she took the actions to make it happen self-fulfilling prophecy 
Like, I feel confident in predicting the dishes will be washed if I'm the one washing them. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it, it's just fascinating to me because you get, first off, we have to say, can we trust Melisandre and her visions? But then we see Jon Snow as Azora High in the vision. And then we have to ask, is that true? Like, do we believe in R'hllor? Or is it not R'hllor? Is it something else? You know, it. it yeah, or is there, you know, yet a third interpretation of what she's seeing? There's a lot of depth there and you could play with it. And I'm not even necessarily positive that George knows where that's, you going. know, the reason that we see John in the flames is because he's a secret Targaryen and Targaryens do fire. He so. actually is the only secret, Targaryen, which is kind of funny. That's why he's in the fire though. I guess Griff's a secret Targaryen. He's a black fire clearly, but um, that's still a Targaryen. It surely is. Yes, and Derry brought up a good point. Melisandre sight also parallels many of Quaith's words, and that's right. They both see the pale mare. They both see that, which is why, like, the pale mare is like a, obviously a sign of uh, plague, or fam uh, it's like plague and famine uh, in historical context, which I think is going to be grayscale. But I also wonder if there's like another interpretation of that. Somewhere. Also, well, what do we think of grayscale in terms of like? Is it just disease or is there like a magical component to grayscale? Yeah, that's a good question. And I wonder like what the motivation was to write it. Cause it's a very specific. Well, disease. I mean the way that like Tyrion doesn't catch it, but like the other guy does. And that like, hmm. I mean, I mean, disease does work that way sometimes where you're like, well, why did they catch it? And not the other person. Um, but at the same time, is it more like mystical than that? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think we'll figure it out once Connington gets to Westeros, because I, I do firmly believe that there's going to be some sort of outbreak of it, uh, whether that happens. Well, he's bringing it. So Yeah, he's just going to be touching everybody. Kissing he babies. is a plague rat. <laughs> he's the plague rat. John the Rat Connington. <laughs> Um, so Melisandre hears the fire or sees rather uh, that he will be a man, then a wolf, and then a man once again. Speaking of Jon Snow, as she comes more infatuated with him. Uh, Maybe is that it's not... Bran. Maybe Bran is his aura high. I mean, is that not as plain as it gets, though? He'll be a man, then a wolf, and then a man once again. Like, that's. I think we know it's going to happen. Couldn't it be right? Bran? I mean, mate. Uh, but she's she asked about Jon or Snow. Or Benjen. Benjen is Rhaegar confirmed. All right. You heard it here first on Alex <laughs> Nunez's channel. Uh, don't get it twisted. <laughs> I'm glad we could settle that. Good talk, guys. <laughs> her, I, I just I just really enjoy her visions and foreshadowing. Um, we actually also find out uh, we see a vision of her as a kid and she's being sold into slavery, which is a, um, a backstory that we didn't know before. And then we also see her for the first time in her POV talk about Davos which I think is pretty cool uh, because Davos at this point has been at odds with her. Uh, he tried to uh, go against her, obviously, and try to kill her. And she still has pity on Davos. I don't necessarily think she likes Davos, but she understands his motivations, which Melisandre by Gurm has said that she is the most misunderstood character in the series. And I think the POV kind of sheds light on that. He presumes a great deal. Perhaps I do not misunderstand her. <laughs> it's an average. I mean, like it's I mean, it's also just the fact that like until now, we've basically not seen anything from her perspective. Yeah. So like you can ju I mean, making judgments about what a person's motivations are and what they're trying to do based on hearsay, based on other people's interpretation of events is going to lead you down false paths. Yeah. What's happening? We're talking about Melisandre and how her visions, uh, you know, she asked for Zora High, sees Jon Snow and says, Stannis, we uh, see her ask about Jon Snow, and it says that he'll be a man, a wolf, and then a man once again, uh, foreshadowed as a resurrection. And we're talking about how we get to see her past uh, being sold into slavery and yeah. how she has pity for Davos. And it's just like Melisandre is like an interesting character, but also Gurm says that she's the most misunderstood. I mean, doesn't that line about John straight up debunk that he'll just come back as a warg? That yeah, he'll he, just be ghost. Like, doesn't that straight up say like he's yeah. gonna warg into ghost and then be John again? Yeah, it, I, it, maybe it's, not John. Maybe he wargs into another man's body. Well, that isn't who. And wouldn't that be wild? I mean, we've established that's an option. Uh, also, John. This well, is an interesting you mean through Hodor and through Thistle. Yeah, but like John. John has no idea what's happening. Like, I don't think 
I think it would make more sense that he would come back to his own body, but who knows? I think he comes back to his own body. I'm just saying there's no guarantee that that's the body he comes back to. It is fun to postulate about who it would be if if not his own body. Ned. Um, <laughs> also, is Zora High supposed to come from Maybe like, Benjamin's body. There it is. That's a wrap. Uh, Adam asked me how far I am into Vinland Saga. I'm on Omnibook 4, I believe. Uh, I think. I need to pick it back up. Um, but yeah, uh, I think John comes back into his own body, but I, I thought it was interesting that Azor High comes from salt and smoke and or so, salt and something, but, um, there's a bunch of salted meat at the night's watch and, in, in the, at castle black. And they mentioned it a couple times and I think he's going to get resurrected in the meat locker. <laughs> so Azor High is a steak. <laughs> he's a beefcake is what he is. Oh it's a God. beefcake. <laughs> Oh, that'd be kind of sick. Stannis so Stannis, Stannis falls in battle against the Boltons. But yeah, Darian. that would make Melisandre's prophecy true. Darian, I love that. I don't like think it will happen, but I love it. I like that, yeah. That's a good That's a good fanfic. I really like that. <laughs> John wakes up like this. How old is Stannis? But what is the significance of, um, uh, you know, Fool Fellow who is with uh, Shireen? Oh, yeah, Patches. I mean, Patches is... Uh, Oh, <laughs> when we see him at Clash of Kings and we kind of talked about how the fact that is he a representation of the drowned God because everyone else on his ship drowned and he was underwater for so many days and they pulled him out and he foreshadows Blackwater Bay. And there's just like too much attention paid to him for him to just be yeah. like, whatever, here's some like fool character. Melisandre's terrified of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pat Patches has a role to play. Kind of Maybe John comes back in Patches. Holy shit. <laughs> Dude, don't get me hype. I'm on it. <laughs> I love that. Or Patches is Tysha. Patches is like Targaryen. <laughs> and he's Targaryen. He's definitely Targaryen. Tysha drowned on her way to where whores go and came back as Patches. Yeah, Patchface <laughs> is definitely uh, super duper creepy. And I think I have a pretty big role to play going forward. I think he's very much like a Lady a Stoneheart character. I like that. Sea white. Fire whites. And see whites now. Yeah. And whites are a bigger deal in the books than they are in the show. You know, mm -hmm. they're described as whites. Um, and Bar uh, Barrick Dondarrion is kind of a uh, proof that fire whites can exist. So. So what, what I hope the books do, do and you don't get enough of it with Barrick, but like, cause Barrick's been resurrected so many times mm -hmm. they made it. I felt like they made it a, a big point or enough of a point that you change when you come back, like yes. you're, you're a little bit less of yourself. Like Barrick says that like precisely, yep. but it doesn't happen. Like Barrick ends up being like a superhero and then dying in some like weird, like religious, like visual to a bunch of whites. But like John gets resurrected in the show and is it, he's just the same person. Yeah. I, and I think maybe they tried to hint at him being different by him being so solemn and cold, but if it, that was a uh, choice, that was a dog shit choice. I agree with you. It wasn't good at all. I think in the books it'll pay off because, um, Gurm has went on record to say that his, but biggest... I mean, there's a difference between being resurrected by like the, by Relore and warging and then returning to another vessel, but he did die unless they're saying that he wargs at the last second. And then comes back to just a body, well, which I think is what the implication is. G Germ is going to something's going to cost because Germ yeah. said that his biggest issue with Lord of the Rings was Gandalf coming back to life. And he said mm -hmm. that he did not like Gandalf the white. Um, yep. And he was talking about how everything has to have a cost. But I mean, uh, we've seen before, not going to specify where, but like there's a cost to being a wolf for a mm -hmm. while. That's what I'm and thinking. It's not the same cost as like being a white. That's like what I'm thinking. Cost, are we but... talking about Robin Hobb now, or are we are we still talking about a saga wise fire? Uh, We're maybe possibly. You'll never know. Who knows? You'll never know. Um, I I I don't necessarily think it's going to be like John never speaks again, but I don't know if we'll ever get a POV. <laughs> he comes back to himself and starts barking, <laughs> pissing on the walls like hiking his Lego. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do wonder: Do we ever get a John POV again? Yes. Maybe it's all ghost POVs. <laughs> he, he we are packed. Actually, there, there will be ghost POVs, guaranteed. 
At least one. There'll be at least one ghost POV. And also, I... Ghost is very aware of Nymeria, which is interesting mm -hmm. because she's rolling around with those packs. Because they and, are pack! And they're moving north, which a yeah. lot of people feel like the uh, Nymeria and her wolf pack will take be a part of taking back Winterfell. Yeah. Uh, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, and John's wanted to go to Winterfell. So he'll go as ghost. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Is it one of Jenny's old ghosts? Never wanted to leave. What a banger. What a banger. You're a oh bard, my. Jimmy. Thank you. Uh, I try. <laughs> um, I think we covered... Everything about Melisandre, uh, except the reveal of Mance Radar, which we kind of talked about. But man, that scene yeah. slaps. Which is like, Nikon? I mean, for as much for as much as like uh, George R. R. Martin does the thing that you're not supposed to do, which is like introduce the resurrection trope so that it was like, well, I can't take any deaths seriously anymore. He does them carefully and he does them rarely so that like it doesn't feel like, well, anybody can go back anytime. Like it does feel like yeah. it is possible, but like, it is not like the likely option. Yeah. We don't fully understand it. And I think it kind of plays into even like real life whenever people die and then they come yeah. back and they have like brain activity while they're dead and stuff like that. Like that, you know, that kind of mystery still exists uh, with this, but we don't see every single, you know, uh, this is why Rhaegar is dead, folks. Uh, this is why Rhaegar is not Mance. Because if Rhaegar is alive, the whole story is pointless. Rhaegar had to die. Uh, that is the catalyst for the series. Yeah. That is the original subversion of the trope. Because in every other fantasy story in the 80s and 90s or there before, uh, um, sorry, uh, Rhaegar would have beat Robert Baratheon. Would have won. Yeah. The big bully. Prince mm -hmm. Charming would have got his bride. Uh, and he the didn't. Child of incest? <laughs> Well, you know, there's always, you know, a, all the fantasies were doing listen, that. <laughs> none of us are perfect. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but I think that that's why this kind of stuff can work in this series is because we've seen the consequences of someone falling off a tower and smashing their legs. Uh, and you can even say, Hey, brands, look at brand. He's going to be able to get into people when he walks through Hodor, but like, look at what's happening to him. He's eating his best friend through paste. <laughs> there's a He's consequence. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Hasn't been proven in the court of law. Uh, neither confirm nor deny. It would be very out of character if something about John isn't different when he comes back. Wait, what if that cannibal island is all green seers? Son of a bitch. Let's go. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. They're all pasting each other. I was going to say, paste them all. Well, that's why they wreck ships, because they need... Brands going to be sucking it down like Gogurt. <laughs> Brand Go gets there, and there's like, you want some paste? And he's just like, huh. This is becoming a theme with you people. <laughs> I love this. Where where's Mira? I love this so much. Dance has the fun the most fun shit. Cause it's fucking crazy. It is crazy. There's so much. We're off the reservation in dance. We it's are. fine. It's fine. What else? Uh, what well we can talk about John. John's kind of like the last POV we haven't really. Have we talked about, about Jamie? No, we actually didn't. And uh we've been we... talking about Jamie. We haven't really talked about Victorian or Euron or like any of that shit. Or either. really Arya. Yeah, we yeah. we only touched on Arya really. Um, I just brought up Arya when I said compared to Bran, like they used her. Yeah, and she's going through her magic thing. Well, this yeah. is why this book is unwieldy because there's a it's, it's so many. wild. So let's talk about John then, because we already kind of talked about some of it. Um, so his wolf dream, uh, we talked about, but it shows that he's aware of Nymeria, which we kind of said. Mm -hmm. uh, John's talk with Melisandre is so good at the beginning of this book, and yep. it's it's uh, one of my favorite chapters in the entire book because she straight up foreshadows his death and even tells him that he knows nothing which how would she have known that it's like you know that that how that's the she kind have of known that he knows nothing yeah and and it clearly knows that that means something to him and it makes I you, kept texting you guys hey she like, has nice red hair dark. too is she secretly like, oh, no. egret oh my she's God, a targaryen Rhaegar. uh not uh, yeah daggers in the dark yeah daggers, daggers in the dark, dark. Uh, and we see kill the boy that was spoken by Eamon repeated constantly yep. in John's brain. And we see that going around. And I think it's interesting that Eamon also told that to egg, uh, mm -hmm. which we'll see in the Duncan egg novellas. And we know that that didn't end well for egg. Cause Spoilers. Egg is... <laughs> fair enough. Well, well, well that doesn't happen in those books. It happens in the world of ice and fire. Uh, Summer hall tragedy. That's all I'll say. Egg tried to hatch some eggs and, uh, made jenny of old stones banger so it's all, he was responsible for that song so it's all good i guess right yes <laughs> oh what about john uh 
um, taking Janice Lynn's head while clean. Uh, he's talking about oh, taking his head while he's cleaning his sword. So. Well, first of all, Janice Slint, the walking piece of shit that he is, what a f- was just like I that great casting by the way. They made him super insufferable yes. on the show, but just like the fact that he even has any kind of backing at the wall, and he's still down to the. The moments before dying, pulling the like, I have friends and caught like that bullshit. And John is just like, he's just going through, he's exhausting every method. Like, I'm not going to kill you. Like, all right, I'm going to let that slide. Like, okay, you're still talking shit. Like, all right, I'm going to let that slide. Oh, what'd you say? All right, let's go hang him. And he's just like, fuck you. You won't hang me, boy. And just like, he's like, hold on, hold on. give me a stone. I'm cutting his fuck his head off. It's just yeah, like, Ed, oh, fetch me my block. <laughs> yeah. Like, let's Can you go. do this. Like, yeah, you can just like, I love the, just like, I'm not going to kill you. All right. I might kill you. All right. Now I'm going to hang you. You know, you pissed me off. I'm cutting your head off. Like it was so good. Very net of him to swing the sword. Also very net of him to being like patient. Yeah. Jedi does not get angry. Okay. I'm fucking killing you. Whatever. (laughs) Justice. So good. And even in the moment when like, when he finally is like, get janos like sees him and you see alistair like he puts his hand like on his sword and is like about to go and john's just like really you want to do that and he's just like <laughs> carry on <laughs> carry on it's great yeah that whole uh that whole like conflict yep. over the last few books getting resolved this way is one of the few moments where we get to be happy i think which is one of the few like hey <laughs> yeah fist pumping uh, yeah. just most of the third. time it's oh no oh no <laughs> and in a lot of ways it's still sad because that's one less person that's on the wall to fight against the whites that are coming right so it's like yeah. he could have maybe been useful to john said and he john understands you know. it nah he wouldn't have even ran Everybody knows he's a piece of crap. He's a punk. Yeah. Sometimes it's better to be down a man if that's the man. Well, oh, and yeah. now you have Tormund, so you win. Because Tormund's the shit. He's so now you don't have John. Oh, rip. <laughs> rip. Uh, Tormund's backstory was pretty cool. Uh, pretty sad and tragic for a man that's so hard. And uh, I, I forgot that he's like kind of more prominent in the books. I always remembered him as being a show character more. Yeah, uh, but he really does come into his own in this book, and it, it's a pretty big piece. He's like, yay for decapitation. <laughs> yeah, what does that say about us? Oh, it's I love the fiction. I was literally cheering. About us. So, my question to you both is Do you think Ramsey Bolton wrote the pink letter to Jon Snow? If not Ramsey, then who? Well, a lot of people think it was either I, so right. uh, some people say Melisandre, and I don't agree with that. Uh, because we get a Melisandre POV and it would be bad writing to not include that, in my opinion. Maybe not bad writing, but it would be like, eh, I don't love it. Intentionally hiding that. I was yeah, say, it's like bordering on lying to the reader. Yeah, I don't think I would love that. Um, some people say it was Stannis. Stannis sent a raven, knowing that it would, because uh, Stannis knows he's screwed, which yeah. I think checks out. The reason why people feel like Ramsey does not write the letter, there's various reasons. People even like go into talking about how he worded things, but the big reason is, is that through the reek POVs and hearing Roos and all these people talk, they never talk about Jon Snow. They never even mention that he might be a problem. So why would Ramsey prov- send something to provoke him to come and basically help Stannis? Like, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for Ramsey to send that letter. I mean, I think it does, but there are angles that you can look at it where it what doesn't. What if it was Oh shit. I mean, I actually, I mean, that would be, I feel like that one would be out of left field, but like, I'm in like, whatever. I mean, Ferris does show up at the end of this book and do some major shit. He um, does. He likes destabilizing shit for Aegon. So he sure does. Uh, some people thought that, um, it was Alistair Thorne somehow. I've seen that thrown around. Um, uh, but the pink letter is definitely one. I don't think it was anyone at the wall cause they fucking kill him. So like, what would have been the point? Um, I don't think it was anyone in Night's Watch. I would agree with that. Yeah. I think it I think it could be Stannis. I think it could be Stannis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mance is the other one. Uh some people said think that it was also Mance. I can see it being Mance as well. I feel like Mance sounds the most likely out of all of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can see Mance doing it because he's very cunning. I can't see Stannis doing that. He's too like 
by the he book. He doesn't think outside the yeah. box. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. I, I would agree with that. I, I think after this reread, I feel more inclined to think that maybe Ramsey did write it, even though I kind of hope he didn't because of what I said, feeling like it's a it kind of exclusion. Like, why wouldn't they have brought up Jon Snow in the POVs if George wanted that to track, you know? Hmm. Yeah, and I, I kind of like what Derry said. The Nor- I don't think the North needs more destabilizing. Yeah, I mean, so I'm just because the Wiki of Ice and Fire poses the theories of either Ramsey, Stannis, Mance, or Wyman Manderley. And now, then, Wyman Manderley. Some people yeah, think Davos wrote it because he learned how to read and write, okay. which I thought was really funny, but no. Wyman so Manderley, Manderley probably, though, mate, that checks it has, out more. Than, I don't think it's Stannis. I don't think it's Stannis. Manderley has the most points in his favor. But there's, there's of course counter arguments to everything, but of course, yeah. Man, Manderly makes a lot of sense, and I also love Manderly, so I'm kind of biased. <laughs> but he's I, also more tricksy than like than Stannis for sure. Oh, it's definitely way more in his character, without a yeah. doubt. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think it was Stannis. Baelish. Nah, that wouldn't make any sense. Nah. nah. But that is what's missing in this book. If Littlefinger was like more involved in the book, sure, but yeah. like he he's not even in it. like. No, I'm not saying that's why like it's him. I'm just like it's reminding me of like that's missing. Yeah, in this book. Yeah, I think Baelish has a bigger, way bigger part to play towards the end game. Uh, definitely different from the show. Well, and... he's gonna show up at Winterfell, and then Arya and Sansa are gonna like double team. That was the first point in the show. Not to derail Crazy. it, but that was the first time in the show where I knew that they were they didn't know what to do. Like where I was like for sure, like I was like, this is going to get bad. Which part? Uh, Peter Baelish's death. I thought that it was very. Oh, that was terrible. It was like they just ran. The whole plot was stupid. Yeah, it was really bad. The whole fake plot of like Arya and Sansa being against each other, and then Arya randomly praising Sansa as like the smartest person she knows. What do you? What is this? It was just not good. Yeah, and none of it it made sense. And then Littlefinger was all of a sudden a moron. Yeah, fell for everything. And yeah, just no. Well, both no. Peter and Varys had to become dumb for the dumb plot to happen. Yeah. So did Tyrion. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the three like smartest, most witty, and like arguably the most interesting. Yeah, so, like I, even Tyrion has his moments of like foolhardy, like selfish, emotional thumb. But like Peter and Varys are always on their A game, plotting, playing like just ten steps ahead of everybody. Like yeah. it's just like no way to that dumb. Yeah. yeah. It does seem like chat kind of agrees with us that maybe Manderly would be the most likely to have written the letter. Yeah, the other thing is betray, he wants to betray the Boltons anyway. Yeah. And Manderly kind of goes on a suicide mission. I mean, we, we see him get slit open and everything. So like, why not throw the hell Mary knowing that yeah. he's causing this big rift in the North by doing this um, and the fray pies and everything. So I think Manderly actually makes the most sense. Yeah, I do. Um, do we even think Ramsey writes letters? Yeah, that's the other thing. It doesn't seem like Ramsey. I mean, it's antagonizing. Ramsey's little stationary kit that he has Reek bring to him. He's... And then he makes one of his whores bend over so he can write on her back. Well, he sent... some hot wax on her. He would cut her hair and send it to John or something, right? Like, I don't see. Because he said. You think uh... he would cut hair, which would in no way hurt her? Well, Have you were... met Ramsey? He might tear it out. I don't know. I, I haven't tortured I'm thinking like lately. limbs, appendages, <laughs> a finger. Or two. <laughs> Some skin. Definitely likes flaying. So that's on that's <laughs> on brand. I wonder what you all think about the Iron Bank showing up and offering John a loan and then John not telling right. anybody he took a loan out. It's like uh, you know, when a relative leaves you with a heaping credit card and you're like, Where was this at? You find out they were like addicted to it. It very much reminded me of Valentin Balk. <laughs> 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 Uh, that, I mean, okay, that, now John's dead. He doesn't owe anything. That, that matters, though, right? Like, th- there's no way George is like, let me just throw a little economics in here. Like, that's going to matter. His debt is gone. He's no longer of the Night's Watch. Well, He's technically also- out of all these things. And Iron Bank is signifying that they don't have confidence in the throne. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the biggest part of it. Yeah. So and that, like the whole like Cersei thinks that she can like do whatever. And you're like, you don't have the money, yeah. though. If you don't have Valentin Valk, you're fucked. <laughs> yeah, it's like, 
are they going to bet? Maybe this is another case for young Griff being able to take the throne because of the iron bank yeah. back. Uh, th there's something Golden going company. on there. Yeah. And I think John, not, he has a moment where he consciously decides not to tell Bowen Marsh. Yeah. That's going to matter. I don't know why or how uh, I'm not an economics person, but I, I think that that is, I don't know. It was a piece I had forgotten about and I think it's important for sure. And it definitely won't end up being like it's in the show, too, like randomly, yeah. like what now to yeah. be just like a, a throwaway. Like it is so like it, it catches your attention by how like out of nowhere it is. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I actually like that stuff in books. Uh, I'm a big fan. like the dagger and the coin plays into that quite a bit. There's like a um, kind of like a um, chosen one, but they're a banker. It's very fascinating. And the war is fought through finance and propaganda instead of I mean, there is swords and shit, but a lot of it's uh, a it's dagger and coin. See, yeah, but you need coin to buy the dagger. There you go. You or you need daggers to win the coin. Yeah, you can't win a war without money. So I, 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 I like that. And I, one of the things in wins a winner that I hope that we get to see if we ever get it is more about the iron bank. I hope that's not something he leaves yeah. for a book. I, I would like to see more of that playing out. The iron bank is going to be huge in wins. The debt isn't John's. It's the wall. The wall has nothing. What is the iron bank going to fucking <laughs> repossess the wall? Oh my God. Could you imagine like, that is like the fall of the wall. Like they tear it down for materials or something. That'd be such a clinical. They're repossessing the wall. <laughs> yeah, you just have them backing it up. You know, <laughs> get Illyrio out there with a forklift. I don't know why Illyrio. I just decided into Illyrio. <laughs> I, I, I was just happy to see him again in this book. Um, uh, oh, and then John dies. <laughs> oh yeah, that. Oh what? <laughs> um. So think about this from the perspective of people who didn't know that was coming. That had to be as big as the Red Wedding for people, right? Maybe not as big, but it's pretty huge. It's massive. I feel like it yeah. kind of gets over, you know, overlooked now because of the show and because of the wait for. No, wins. but also because like enough things have been set in your mind to where you're like, ah, but is he dead though? Versus like with the Red Wedding, you're like, he's dead. He's super dead. I mean, it's it's open enough, but like he got stabbed a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the prologue helps the hope of him being brought back because Plus, all of the times that John is working and all the setup with Bran, like there's enough stuff to where you're like, whoa, sure. but also like, Hmm, how does but, he come back? Not uh, with like Rob. You're like, oh, they are all super dead. More so now. Yeah. Yeah. I think a casual reader could miss it. But there's Absolutely. also have been when we saw the Red Wedding, there had not been a bunch of resurrections between the Red Wedding and John stabbing. We've had Lady Stoneheart. We've seen like Beric and that situation. Like we've seen Possibly multiple now. resurrections. Yeah, Beric. Uh, I think Beric was resident in Clash of Kings, though, right? Mm -hmm. I think. But it was Lady whenever you fought the Hound. Lady Stoneheart's major. Oh, and also yeah. we forgot to talk about the mountain. The mountain's back, and a key difference in the books, Kyburn somehow brings this dude back to life without a head. Because I do yeah. believe they sent his head to Dorn. The theory is, is that one of the dwarf's heads that have been being beheaded is sewn on top of... Yeah, they oh, did, isn't it? Well, I mean, odd? they did sew the wolf's head on top of Rob, so there's some sort of yeah. symmetry there. So dude. are we getting Clegane Bowl? No. With a oh. random... With Penny's brother's head on top? Yes. I do think I do. Uh, so there's some people who hate this, but I, I do think the hound is still going to show up. I think he's going to come back into the story. I think he's too good of a character and yeah. there's too much. Uh, there's too much with Sansa there. There's something with Sansa that's going to happen. Some people will hate to hear that. They get really upset because they think the grave digger is a great ending for him. Uh, but I do think we'll see him back. I don't think we'll get Clegane Ball, though. That's fan. I mean, that was just a fanfic. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was dope scene. In my opinion, I thought it was pretty dope, but like, did it make a ton of sense? Not really. Uh, was it dope? Yeah. I mean, Kyburn getting yeeted into a wall was pretty Dude. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That was the most Game of Thrones moment in the final season. Like, that felt like Game of Thrones. Hmm. It's like, oh, you walked by these two destroyers and got your head smashed into the wall. Makes sense. <laughs> what, Leanna? You yeah, don't what? like him getting his... No, I'm well, trying to think if I agree that there's that's the most Game of Thrones moment of the last. Actually, season. I know what my most Game of Thrones moment is, but no one would agree with me, so I'm not going to share it. No, what? now you have to. Nah, now you have to. <laughs> You're contractually obligated as part I of the read along. Loved the first half of the last episode of Game of Thrones. 
I thought Nate Ron killing Danny was so – it was so good. I thought it was so well executed. I mean, I think it was well acted and well shot, but like narratively, like I don't think we like really got there. Uh, I so it was rushed and everything. I don't mind the end point, and I just thought the scene. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, it was like at the, this is the scene that was written for them. They executed it very yes. well, but like because nothing had led me there before that, then it couldn't be as satisfying as it should. Yeah, be. Yeah, I'm saying if you ignore everything into that point and you get the whole wings behind her on the st- and everything. Don't oh. forget the dragon burning the symbol. Yeah. I mean, I, I know everyone hates it, but I, I, I actually thought the first half and then I thought the King's Council was trash. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I, I really enjoyed the first half of the last episode, which is my super unpopular opinion. My also unpopular opinion. I thought season seven was worse than season eight, but that's a whole nother app. That's a I mean, neither was good, but I thought seven was way more egregious, but I also think seven and eight was still better than most of the things on television at the time. So it is what it is. Well, certainly like from like a visual cinematography. It's the standpoint. potential that's disappointing. It's the potential of what it well, could... it's just like it is. It is a different show. Yeah. Like if this was like if I yeah. regard season seven and eight as like a, you know, a more cookie cutter Xena esque fantasy yeah. then I'm like, well, wow. But like that's not what you trained me to expect with this. Like this is if not you're watching it for spectacle, which is what they turned it into. You can have fun with it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't hate it as much as everyone. Uh, it's just, uh, and I don't, I didn't necessarily like everything, but yeah. I mean, it was still well acted and well shot and well costumed and well scored. Like, I have to go. I mean, honestly, the, okay, my favorite part of season eight is Pod singing Journey of the Old Stones. I love that. That episode. I love that episode. episode. That was episode two, right? Yeah. That's where I actually had hope for season eight, was that episode. I mean, there were things about it that still felt too corny to be Game of Thrones. Like, sure. But, like, it, him it was very, it's so haunting when he sings it's it. It's very in Hollywood. Show. It's As, very, like, this is what you would see in a, any other kind of, like, fantasy Hollywood thing. But just like them, it was a lot more talking and just people in rooms, like, discussing things. And I was like, this actually feels like it has heart to it. I, so and then I, zombie waves happened. I uh, I have to go with my gut, and this is the reason why I say this because I didn't like really participate in the online discussion. Like I knew it was popular, but I, didn't oh, I was really... obsessed with it. So I, you know, as someone who like loves the books and whatnot, um, I remember watching it and just being like, "Oh, it was pretty good." Like I was like, it obviously had declined in the past season, but it's pretty good. And then I found out that like everyone hated it, so it would be very disingenuous of me just to yeah. have on it. Like so, my visceral, like my gut reaction to it was like, "Oh, like they wrapped it up." Okay. See, I think that's a good thing though. Because you almost like kept yourself more pure. Like I, I went into season eight like having read all the leaks, and then I was like, "That's too stupid. The show's not going to do that." And then I started so, seeing it on screen, and I was like, "Oh no!" So, okay, I didn't see any of the discussion online like Alex did, but also like I didn't feel satisfied by it. Like I'm not going to say that I was like oh, I called it; it was bullshit. But like I, re- I remember feeling extremely hollow and disappointed yeah. by it. And then, like, it's because I hadn't seen all the discussion online that, like, I wasn't, I hadn't yet zeroed in all the specific ways it had failed. But I was like, you stopped telling a slow, organic story. This See, I think wasn't I fe- it. I felt that in season six a little bit, and then seven, I was like, I, 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 I hated season seven. Yeah. Like, I remember that was my gut reaction with season seven, like going behind the wall and we're gonna bring a white walker to Cersei. And that yeah, was, that was dumb. I was just well, like, and again, I think I've said before that like I stopped watching when it went off book. And then like right before like the ending was going to happen, like that weekend, I binged like seasons like five, six and seven. And so then I watched the slow decline of the storytelling so that by the time season eight was going on, I was like, nope, nope, nope. This is bullshit. (laughs) Well, I mean, as as people who, you know, didn't like the last uh, seasons, I think we would all agree that like these books have so much going for them beyond what was adapted. For sure. Uh, Which is what I've tried. Germ wanted way more seasons yeah and i think people literally were... everybody wanted more seasons only D didn't it yeah. amazes me uh the blame that george takes um for that as if the book you know well, and if i just think... stop doing anything else in publishments of winter then nobody would blame him anymore it's his own fault and uh i think people will underestimate how much uh being rich and comfortable changes things to I, I... be fair I think you can critique him based on when the show started getting adapted. I believe it was kind of maybe written or unwritten agreement that 
wins would be yes in the works and done. Not that they were going to get to season eight and be like, why do we still not even have the next book? Like, I yeah. don't think that was ever supposed to be happening. Yeah, so I guess that seems fair. I, yeah, no, that, that is fair. And I'm not saying that you can't criticize them. I, I should be more clear. I think people then try to retcon and say the books actually weren't that good. The books don't. It doesn't matter if he finishes them because sure. there's there's nothing else that can be said. We already know the ending. That and I just think that that's really disingenuous if you've yeah. read these books. Uh, and, and if it's been a while, you should reread them again. I mean, like, uh, there's nothing to say that maybe possibly when we see the end of that he writes, maybe it's gonna be garbage, but it's gonna be very different garbage from what we saw in the show. Yeah, I firmly believe we saw a lot of things that are going to happen. It's just yeah. going to be so much better because it'll feel more organic. Well, the and characters yeah, be out of context. The yeah. characters are much better in the books. Uh, I think I mean, the characters show did... are also in different places. So, I mean, it's yeah, it's the they're different people. Make more sense. Yeah. Danny is a totally different person in the show than she is in the books. That's Absolutely. Also, like different. if the thing that makes her crazy is like not even in the show, then you're like, you can't be like, well, she goes crazy in the books. We can guarantee it. Yeah. Okay. But the situation around her will be different. So yeah. like that matters <laughs> and a lot of the inner dialogue that danny has in her head in this book will matter mm -hmm. will matter a lot absolutely uh, i love so this jamie book. oh yeah jamie gonna get hung <laughs> brienne's found him and is obviously bringing him back to lady stoneheart he's already hung oh my god <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> took me like two seconds fantastic quote of the stream my goodness. You know. Mom Jimmy drinks and I clap. <laughs> All right. So do we actually want to talk about Jamie? Well, there's not much that happens. I know. Uh, he's not. He's like barely in the book. We kind of just get the uh, to be I mean, We get like a lot of Jamie and Feast. So. Yeah. I mean, to see him pop up at all. It's like, let's go. Like, when I see his name pop up. I forgot he was in this book. I yeah. actually forgot. I thought I had misremembered Brienne and him reuniting. And then getting this, it's like, oh, man. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it'll be interesting Ryan. to see what happens. of Toth. <laughs> because you have having Brian faces when you get all the good Jamie shit and you get Brian literally getting her face eaten. <laughs> and then she's about to be killed by that Lady Stoneheart. Wild. She yells out a word. And I still don't uh, know what that is. Yeah, we still don't know she, what that she is. She said pink bast. She said Jamie. Jamie, Jamie. She said no. <laughs> <laughs> That's, what it is. That's what I would say. She no, said do it. fiddlesticks. <laughs> yes, exactly. What other POVs have we not hit on, or have we? Uh, we 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 kind of glanced over Arya again. Um, you know, Arya's thing is very much Whatever, her. She's she's like blind and stuff what Alex, where's my your camera, camera? <laughs> Hello? i hear a voice what is this <laughs> who is speaking interview? to us says your browser has lost connection to your camera make sure you have the right camera selected and close any other applications that might be using do it do you Skype see soon. that circle talking to us jimmy it's very creepy this is very weird it's it's very uh what is it in 2001 space odyssey <laughs> <laughs> we're back stupid stream yard Trying to oh yeah, we up. haven't talked about Arya. <laughs> she's blind. She's training. She's working. She's not blind. She's still warging. holding on to the little piece of Arya that exists inside her, which is pretty important. And warging. <laughs> she's selling oysters, clams, and cockles. Or is that the last book? I think it's both. Whatever. So she's being Arya and then not being Arya. And yeah, Arya gets to work into the cats of Bravos. Was she? Did she have an earlier chapter that I'm missing, or was the first one when she's blind? It's like halfway. It's through the, the blind book. girl. Yeah, I think she starts out blind. God damn, that's the 45th chapter in the book. Yeah, she's not in into it later because well, all the she's feast, in feast. Yeah, right? the, all the feast mm -hmm. uh, POVs come in the back half of the book. Uh, Oso said Sam, but I don't believe Sam has a POV in this book. No, we see Sam through John. Sending him off, which, which is again when I was like, wait, but he all oh, wait. No. OK, we're we're back before that, I think that's right. the most egregious one. Yeah. yeah. Did you even hear about hard home and Arya's chapter? That's oh, pretty. Yeah, weird. that's right. She hear it because she hears it from pirates talking about yeah. wildlings at hard home. That's wild. 
It's God, wild I wait, bling. <laughs> I, I hate it. I hate it so much. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember if, and I might, and I, I wish I could remember. It's saying. Darion who uh, deserts the watch in Bravos, right? Yeah. And he gets killed by Arya, right? I think that's correct because it's definitely, it's not, who did they, they had her kill Marin Trant in the show? And he's like not even there. Or like it was totally different. Yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah, they like made her drink some shit and they blinded her. And then once she completed whatever her level of training was, they uh, made her unblind. <laughs> yes, uh, she recognized him as a deserter of the Night's Watch. Arya lures uh, Darren into an alley or Darion, however you say it, one night and slits his throat as punishment for his desertion. She slumps his body into a canal though she keeps his boots. There you go. Dead man's boots. So we talked about Barris then. Talked about... Don't care about that. Somebody named Cletus. <laughs> we talked about Asha. I mean, she wasn't in it very much. Who are these other ones? The King Breaker? What? Oh, oh, how interesting. Darion is a reference to the Cimmerillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, Darion is an elvish minstrel in uh, in the Cimmerillion, and Darion is the black singer in Bravos. Nice. Very, che- very cheeky, George. I think this scene specifically. I mean, obviously, was Song of Ice and Fire is just a Tolkien redux. <laughs> oh, my God. It's basically the same thing. I almost had to have that argument last night. With That's who? Not- Nobody. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, this person Random has no name. name. This person has no name. <laughs> was it a drug that was given to Arya that made her blind by Jahar? Wasn't it just like water? Or uh, it, just, like, did it? Yeah, it was in uh, Jakar, was it? I think it, maybe it was. Well, Jakar doesn't exist. Jack the and man Jakar? has no name. Hmm. <laughs> I think we've covered all of the POVs. I think we did it. Did we? I, I mean, Victorian's not in it for more than like a sorry, minute. We did technically not talk about Victorian. Victorian thinks he's going to so outsmart. Dumb. He's so dumb. He's so <laughs> dumb. He's so you are no, like, so if there dumb. is a superfluous POV, it's him. Because I'm just like, you're just dumb. <laughs> yeah, and like it's obvious that the uh, dusky woman or whatever they call her is a plant from Euron, and she has her tongue cut out, but she's probably communicating with Euron somehow. And he's not going to take. Oh my god! <laughs> oh no! Uh, Victoria, where horrors go? Which is to Euron, I guess. <laughs> to a watery grave. To the Iron Islands. I mean, Kevin. So the epilogue. Oh, I mean, the, the epilogue that. is so good. Because the epilogue is sick. Yeah. So another. See, this is why, like, because when you change, this is just, like domino effect of like changing things so like show version you have kyburn using the spare like the little birds to just murder pycelle in a dungeon but this time you get it it's varus who has his little (laughs) knife brigade for kevin and pycelle which is pretty bananas so let's talk about it let's talk about the epilogue just before he gets burned by danny for being dumb (laughs) <laughs> stop when he's just writing letters and very obviously committing treason and she's just like hey i see your treason <laughs> now watch this dragon come out of the darkness and burn you no the show's dumb stop honestly the epilogue is a bigger holy shit moment for me than john snow's death because we have the um because you saw we, it coming yeah because we we know that he's probably going to be okay given all the context clues we've been given in earlier in the book he's a high yeah I mean, he's he has to rise, right? And we even see it in Melisandre's uh, visions. Oh, but boy. Kevin Lannister, it's like we just see him seeing Cersei getting out of the sept and or you know out of the the. And Kevin has seemed like the one steady, like not psycho, not Lannister. emotionally disturbed yeah. Lannister yeah. member. That's why he's got to go because we're trying to destabilize exactly. Lannisters. You're too normal. You're too sane. He's too good go. at it. Yeah, it's he. He would make him look too good and. You know, you kind of get this feeling that like Kevin's about to become a bigger player in this game because Cersei's going to be sent back to the rock. And yep. it turns out, no, 
I mean, what? That's a huge twist. And Varys coming like, back. It would be like, great for the kingdom if Cersei got sent back to the Rock. So we can't have that. Yeah. I'm yeah, we learned where John Con is that he and the Dornish maneuvering has started. Yep. He made it. See, I'm just wondering to tell you. Keep in mind, it's yeah. snowing heavily at this point in King's Landing. Pretty cool. Winter is here. So that has to mean something. The winds of winter. Oh, is that like the name of one of the books in the series? Not yet. We, we think so. Not yet. Did you know the I cover believe. that everyone shows with the horn of winter is a fan art? It's not the official cover. It's just like all. all of the times people show Doors of Stone, that pink cover, that's fan art. Yeah. Uh, the House of the Dragon poster that Gurm tweeted out last week was also fan art. <laughs> but you'd think that he would do the Whoops. official poster, but he just tweeted out fan art. <laughs> What a G. Yeah, we see that Euron's uh, fleet in the south is becoming a true problem. Yep, and young Griff has landed. Uh, man, Winds has so much shit that's happening right at the get-go. We get the battle with Stannis and the Boltons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously, we get to see what happens with Danny. Uh, Marine's a shit show. Griff, sieging. Well, I'm just, this just makes me think. So, like, we've been saying how, you know, the arc is sort of like a three book arc, you know, with the first three. Uh -huh. And so you've been saying that feast and dance, therefore wins is the third one, but dance is the second King half of, of feast. Probably. Yeah. So like, so uh, we, yeah. Uh, what's, wins might wins be, it's going to be clash. Ultimate, ultimate and then network. dream is going to be. Well, I, yeah, I, I think that's definitely true to an extent, but I think George even said that dance finishes the five year gap, but also continued it. Uh, like are like was the afterthoughts of that. So some of yeah. it was new, but I think you're right. I think there's going to be absolutely stuff that we have to have resolved that doesn't, mm -hmm. we don't see in the winds of winter, but I think a lot of the immediate conflicts like Stannis, for instance, is pretty big. Marine is pretty big. Well, I mean like uh, winds Rift. of winter is going to have like a battle of the black water, the way that clash did. Yeah. Maybe the, but opening but the, the storm of swords, like parallel is going to be in dream of spring. Yeah, I think that's true. I think winds of winter, you also probably get John's parentage. Which is God, the be... issue that I'm seeing now is like so much of this still like there's so many things that still probably have to happen before we even get to some of these moments. Because I think dream like, of spring, a dream of <laughs> spring is like where like where Danny is right now. Like she's surrounded by Dothraki out on a fucking hill. Like she does like she's not even ready to like sail to, to Westeros. Danny's Westeros, not. Danny's yeah. what? Dan I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, you're good. Uh, Danny's right. not going to uh, leave for Westeros until the end of Winds of Winter. And Danny hears Jorah's so... voice whispering to her. But like that's kind of crazy, though. So, like, when does Griff get there? So, Griff's getting there. He's already there. He's going to get there first, right? He is going to take, in my opinion, he's going to take King's Landing in the Winds of Winter. A Dream of yes. Spring will be the fact that Danny is coming, thinking she's saving all of her people, yada, yada, yada. And you'll have the White Walkers. Um, it's going to be massive. Also, a uh, thing about the show that we that we shouldn't get conflated is that I do believe that the White Walkers are the ultimate end. The ultimate bad, yeah. They are the finale, and Danny is going to have to have a role in fighting them as well she as dragons. Yes, like there's a very good chance that she will take care of Young Griff, and then. Um, you will we'll see the white walkers North, start coming. Yeah. Yes. Um, like she might even be ruling at that point and people aren't happy, but the white, and then she dies come. fighting the white walkers and then Bran the broken becomes king of Westeros. So then is there possible she'll die to the white walkers? Yeah. Yeah. So then is there, do you think there would be a time jump at some point from like winds to dream? No, I don't no. think. No, I, I think he's probably booted. His time has come and gone for a time jump. Yeah. But if you think about it, if he makes each book 1,300 pages, that's 2,600 pages. Like, that's that's a, a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I always think about what Tad Williams was able to accomplish in To Green Angel Tower, which is the longest fantasy book I think ever published. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that gets handled in that. So I do... I'm I'm optimistic that it could be finished in two books. Do I think we'll ever get the last book? No, um, I really don't. I think we'll get wins, but I, I don't think I mean, we'll just, get because even just the the stuff for King's Landing, like it's setting up perfectly for for Griff to yep. take over and step in at the right time, just based on the the epilogue. Because like Kevin shows up and Varys shoots him with a crossbow, and he sees Pycelle's already dead, and then Varys straight up tells him like you're too good of a Lannister, and that would have fucked everything up. 
And then it was just like, well, uh, the Tyrells will blame Cersei for mm-hmm. this. Someone will blame the Dornish. And then everyone else is just going to get at each other's throats and try to kill each other. And then Griff's going to show up and be like, I'm here. Yeah, And Ariana Join is going to marry him. I, yeah. I think Ariana will marry him, and I think that is why Marjorie Tyrell probably has to get axed. It's the axe, yeah. Um, it's also interesting that Kevin, who I think we all kind of trust as a POV, says he looks at Cersei and says she was actually right about the Tyrells. They have been moving mm-hmm. while this is happening. Like, she was actually more right about the Tyrells than I thought. So the Tyrells aren't totally innocent. Yeah. Who said they were innocent? Well, we're, we're, I guess I always sided with them because I, like the I didn't guys. like Cersei so much, you know? But I like, mean, like, okay, but innocent and siding with are two different things. Oh, like, that's fair. that's fair. I mean, if the victims are the Lannisters, which is like debatable, yeah, they, that's fair. they are a necessary evil the way that Jamie killing Ares is a necessary evil. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, David asks, do you think young Griff will be able to tame Dragon? No, he's a black fire. I think he's going to get melted. I don't think anybody's going to. Unless we go the route of like the horn control. Well, her and John are gonna ride them together. I like what Derry's saying. Fagon could well marry both Ariana and Mar Marjorie, which would be a uh, callback to um Aegon the Conqueror. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool, dude. I like that. Well, I was that. thinking more like in terms of if we're paralleling the tutors, because Marjorie having previously been married and now being the like, well, I guess you're next, is more like Catherine of Aragon, Henry's hmm. first wife. And that he would like put her aside to marry Arianne, who would be like his Anne Boleyn. Because Anne Boleyn got killed for not being able to have sons, right? And he like yeah. accused her of adultery. But Catherine got put aside because yeah. she was like previously married his brother and like also couldn't give him a son. Man, if we could just play f- for you know fun fiction here for a second, I'm going to call it fun fiction instead of fan fiction. It would be interesting to see Griff and Danny marry. Like, if they just became a unit, like, how do you even stop that? You wouldn't be able to, which With is Azora High. But also, I don't think Danny would allow that. Hmm. Like yeah. If Griff, if Griff proposed that, she'd be like, nah. I, she does. I don't need a man. I think she actually, doesn't she? And I might be misremembering, but I thought I remembered her saying that she wishes that Aegon was still alive so she could have married him. Yes. Oh man! Yes. Oh no! In between oh, thoughts no. of banging Daria. Oh, no. Oh no! 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 <laughs> Is Jon Snow gonna end up with Danny in the books? No, I I don't see it. But part of me th- wonders. I don't. I don't want it in the books. <laughs> I don't, I don't want. I don't want it <laughs> at all. I mean, I didn't want it in the show either. It was pretty gross in the show. Yeah, it's a pretty gross series. (laughs) There's a lot of gross shit. What was gross about it is like you're meant to think Jamie and Cersei are like, oh shit, that's incest. Oh no. But with with Danny and John, it the show coded it as like we're meant to like ship that. But it was like Yeah. Because they're they're hot and they want to bang. (laughs) I mean, to be fair, Jamie and Cersei is worse. And even in the show, like the book, they have sex next to Joffrey's corpse. In the show, they do that. <laughs> oh, which is but they, so but they also make it look like Jamie's like raping her. So they made it even worse. Like, yeah, it's not very cash money. <laughs> not <laughs> very, as George R. R. Martin would say. They also in the show they money. made they made Cersei a lot more sympathetic in the show. She's a lot less like wildly crazy as yeah. she is in the books. Yeah, yeah, the books. Uh, she's definitely a little harder to root for, I would say, because she's a Targaryen. Oh, yeah, because no one roots for Targaryens in that show. Never. No, that's Never. why she's crazy. Because she's blonde. She likes fire. Hello. Likes to sleep with her family. It only makes sense. We like to keep it in the family. <laughs> she likes. <laughs> oh, I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> now that we're getting delirious, did we miss anything? I, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, we, sure we did, missed, but. but... <laughs> I guess not. So if that is where we are ending this at nearly three and a half hours, what's up? What's up next? Uh, uh, Jimbo, what's what's the next one? 
we'll be hopping over here to the Fantasy Network to cover uh, the uh, short story collection of the Night of the uh, Night of the Seven Kingdoms by George R. R. Martin. Uh, it's the Duncan Egg Tales, people. Come on, Duncan Egg is amazing. I like it just as much as the main series. Uh, they're not as long. Which is nice. I think. I uh, mean, we, I looked at that book and it's yeah. this long and, and like, half of it's pictures. Uh, <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <yes>. Deliciously <laughs> short. Uh, Viserys from the TV show is the aud- audiobook narrator and it is fantastic. I, I really uh, would implore everyone to listen to the audio and join us for that because it's going to be a lot of fun. It's not going to take a lot of time. And there's a lot of really good stuff in there that ties into the main series. Uh, Blood Raven's going to be featured and also some of George's best writing. It actually has my favorite, like, opening couple lines of any book ever so uh I feel like I'm, you've said that too many times jimmy for it to mean anything no there's only two books i think of it's that and the coward by stephen aaron has a great opening i love that opening it's a great opening which i actually love the book in general to oh be good fair. that's awesome i think i liked it more than you i thought the beginning and ending were awesome yeah for the sure middle, the middle drug a little bit but eh, it was good what do i know honestly so then after Jimmy, Jimmy John's channel. We'll do fire and blood. Jimothy. James, fire. Jimmy, Jim, Bob, Jim. Fire Bob. and blood is going to be really interesting to go. Have through. you read it yet? I've never read it cover to cover. I haven't either. I've read pieces, uh, maybe all, all but a few of the chapters or the pieces, I should say, because it's kind of split up differently. But I, uh, Simon Vance does that audio book and I'm really excited to, uh, to listen oh, to it. Not Roy. It's not Roy. Roy is dead. So. Yeah, Leanna. Way to kick a man when he's down. <laughs> he doesn't know. Brutal. So, Night of the Seven Kingdoms next month on Jimmy's. Fire and Blood after on Leanna's. And then if we're... And then we'll be back enough, to Alex's channel for some more bloody goodness. For what? From, uh, Empire, oh, Empire of the Vampire. The Vampire? <laughs> well, I was going to say unless we... <laughs> Do this one. I mean, I would definitely read that. I, I mean, it doesn't it. read like a. It's not like an interesting like narrative, though. Well, we could always do that. Pick out things that we thought were interesting, and then just kind of speculate. Got super badass pictures, though. I don't think we have any problem filling the uh, the air the air time. I think we could do it. I know we read it together with Empire of the Vampire and compare and contrast. Oh Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> so one was definitely better as a story. We can say that, <laughs> but the others was better on every other level. <laughs> I'm going to laugh when we all love it. There's a chance I might like it. Who knows? But the more I hear about it, the more I'm like, oh, my God, this I is read the, the first worst. page because someone shared it with me and I was like, it is worse than I thought. <laughs> that's that's adorable. So I'm not even going to entertain it. I did say, though, oh, we, we did say at the end of this read along winds was going to come out. So so May two to three months. It'll be out for sure. Oh, shit. I really hope 2024 this, folks. This is where we're going to end it. I really 2024. What? That's been I my really, guess. I really hope that house of the dragon ends. And there's just like a little like splash screen after those just like wins December, 2022. I'd be like, what? I literally lose my mind. <laughs> like, I don't know what I would do. First thing I do is go and uh, go live You're on my right? channel and call out every single person that's, that's made a video. After you finish funny. breathing into a paper bag, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would die before it comes out. That would be very uh, on brand. If I die, you guys can just like do a stream and talk about how much you miss me. <laughs> then I'll go to your house and I'll stream from your couch. <laughs> but bring your dog, which Jimmy worked into. <laughs> it's got dark so quick. Like, that's. <laughs> I can't point here, yeah. here. That's Jimmy. He's that, licking his paws. That is me licking my paws. <laughs> I'm You're very, very cute. I'm a very good boy. <laughs> <laughs> the goodest boy. Okay. It's late for us on the East Coast. It's early for Liana. I mean, it's late ish. 930 is not late. Are there rumors? Early. I doubt it. No, there's nothing. No. But I, I 2024. That, that's my guess. There's no rumors. It's who knows at this point. I'm still not convinced that we're getting wins. To be we, honest. we might but just have to reread again. When? <laughs> Keep Tomorrow. rereading until we get... <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> reread until morale improves. <laughs> I will say reading this and, and reading other books, uh, 
I still really like this a lot more than everything else. I read. Oh, do yeah. you? I mean, it's, it's great. It it it, it really puts in perspective. <laughs> Listen, why don't you go reread first log? <laughs> I it will she be this will. week. Go make a vlog. All right, with yeah. your, your co-editing and your good points. Good idea. <laughs> No, this was, I mean, it's not over yet. Obviously, we have at least, you know, Fire and Blood and Night of Seven Kingdoms, but it's been fun to go back through these. And I did feel that, though, of like coming back to a Game of Thrones, I was like, damn, like this is just really well written. This is good. And then there's a lot of fantasy that I'm just like, this is fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, the whole reason why I started my channel was like looking for the next A Song of Ice and Fire. And I can confidently say I've never found it. Uh, Nothing really scratches the itch like this does. Found some other new favorites, which is awesome, but nothing that kind of puts it all together. Tad the... Williams. Tad Williams, Robin Hobb. I really like Malazan a lot, but they're all different. You know, uh, they stand out on their, like their pillars and all that. She's waiting for you to say the A word. Uh, there's this other guy, Anaconda or something. I, I don't know. Oh, Abercrombie. That's right. First law. There we go. He's on my she, top shelf. Relax. She was going to get closer and closer to the camera. It was about to be scary. <laughs> Like full I mean, on Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I still need to read King Killer and Gentleman Bastard. Yeah, I haven't started either of those either. But yeah. neither of those are finished either. So they're yeah. so good. I'm I'm down. I'm definitely reading Name of the Wind. I mean, it's like I was gonna say, like our vibe is unfinished series over yeah. here. Yeah, is that so. our thing now? I'm fine with it. I don't even care. But yeah, right. Gentleman Bastards and King Killer can confirm God tier. I hope I love it. What for when the read along of series that are guessing games, right? We just continuously do unfinished series and then lies a lot more. But I feel like also, so when you say like trying to find the next, uh, you know, thing that scratches that itch, but that's the thing though. Like, I feel like they each scratch different itches. Like, it's not like, I mean, I love first law, obviously, but like it doesn't scratch the same itch that Kinkiller does. And so, finishing name of the wind, if I was looking for like the thing that's gonna like scratch that itch, it's not first law. But also, like, if I was trying to scratch the first law, it's King Killer would not be the one. Like, yeah. they're yep. different. Like, they are all God tier for different reasons. Yep. P- pillars of, of taste is, is how I always describe it. And I, I agree with you totally. Um, like, I can't read anything like Malazan. Like, Malazan's its own thing. And I don't always want to read that. The only difference is I always want to read a song of ice and fire. <laughs> like I'm always, I always like, want to read first. Law. <laughs> yeah, it's like like do I start to reread now? Like do I wait? You know, it's 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 always been like that, and I've done a good job until this, uh, kind of keeping away from it. I think it's safe period. to wait. I think it's at safe this to wait. point. I will say I don't know if I will reread the main five again unless we get wins. Uh, Ever. Now, well, no, no. I was saying now if it becomes a situation where we never can get that, and George, whatever happens. Then of course I'll reread, uh, but I might just wait off for for a while after this, uh, because it is fun like taking like a two year break or whatever it was since the last time I read these, like a lot of stuff was brand new, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, the you Jamie chapter, lot. yeah, yeah. I'm just like oh shit Jamie's in this book I forgot it's I don't great. think I've gone two years between first law reread that's because you have a sickness you have a problem <laughs> probably should have a couple years in they there need to have a talk <laughs> but honestly it makes me happy oh. okay. Hold on, of all of it? Oh, yeah. Derry's legit read it a bazillion times. Is that like, just like an annual reread of the entire universe? I don't know anyone that knows That's more about Robin Hobb and dedication. Derry. Yeah. Also, it's know. just because, like, I mean, reread, like, let's That's say it was like the first law trilogy 21 times. That's a lot, but it's a trilogy. But Realm of the Elderlings is like, oh, it's so good. many 14? books. 16? How many Realm books of the Elderlings is phenomenal. The closest thing I've gotten to a Song of Ice and Fire, for sure. I mean, it's like they're friends or something. Yeah, right. Same editor. Crazy. All right, George. folks. What were we about to say, George? I was going to say, I, I wouldn't be surprised if George boosted some ideas from Robin Hobb, and I think we all know what I'm talking about, and I'll leave it at that. Explain. Warging and such. And that's so- why I brought it up earlier. Yeah. That's Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait till you're on ship starts talking to him. I'd shit. That'd be dope. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. I'm, I'm all the way in. Except Euron would probably do weird things to it. Show Euron would definitely try to fuck it. Sure, sure, sure Euron would take it on pimp my ride and then be like, isn't that sick? Uh. He'd stick a finger in the bum. Yeah. 
What a what a loser. All right. Yes. Finish Farseer. Oh, so Farseer is fantastic. And then you'll understand what we're talking about. I don't know if you've read. I'm not going to say anything. Uh, that's going to do it for a dance with some dragoons. Um, thank you all for, for sticking with us for this five book. I almost said five book trilogy because I'm tired. <laughs> also for how this, many hours cumulatively have our has this read along been for our Jesus lives? Jesus Christ. <laughs> 10 to hours. How many hours have we just talked like about? Like you could it? watch all the extended editions of Lord of the Rings or you <laughs> could watch <laughs> our lives. <laughs> We've probably had like 15 hours of live streams. We get slightly so intoxicated and uh and we still have two more books to go. So I can't wait. All right. Next one will be on Jimbo Nuts channel. So see you all then. Thank you for joining. Have a good evening. I'm going to go to bed now because I'm tired. Same. I'm old. You are old. <laughs> <laughs> good night, guys. See ya. Where's the end broadcast button? I almost hit. For the love studio. of God. <laughs> Daggers in the dark. <laughs>